All right, thank you. Good morning and welcome to the Day Zero event on the Declaration for the Future of the Internet, or DFI. And I'm sure you are all aware, but the DFI was launched in April of 2022 and represents a political commitment among Declaration partners to advance a positive vision for the Internet and digital technologies. And our focus of this event is on the multi-stakeholder community. And so I'm so pleased that all of you have joined us here today. My name is Jaisha Ray. I'm the Associate Administrator for International Affairs at the National Telecommunication and Information Administration, or NTIA. And I'll be your Master of Ceremonies today. I was particularly pleased to work alongside my colleagues from the Department of State and alongside our co-organizers from this event from Japan, the EU, and Kenya. And so with no further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Vera Yurova, the Vice President of the European Commission for Values and Transparency and Europe Fit for the Digital Age. Please. Ladies and gentlemen, Dear guests, dear participants, I am really very glad to be here today and thank you very much for, for having me here today. By the way, konnichiwa Kyoto. I was very much looking forward to come here. Not only because uh, we are going to do something very important here and to discuss uh, what is the future of internet, what kind of internet we want. And so today in Kyoto, we come together to reiterate our commitment to an internet that is global, open, trustworthy, inclusive, and secure. We want an internet for all, one that reinforces, not weakens, democracy. We want to improve its governance and infrastructure so that it can deliver on its original promise of connecting people and helping societies thrive. Tensions between different models of digital transformation can threaten the open global internet that we enjoy today. Let us focus not on what we oppose, but on what we support and the future of the internet we aspire to. Because we believe the internet should be a trustworthy place without discrimination, anchored in dignity and integrity, where Universal access is for everyone, no matter where they are, to connect to the open internet. Fundamental rights, democratic freedoms and international laws are fully respected. What is illegal offline is illegal online. People and businesses can trust that they are safe online, that their data is secure and their privacy protected. Businesses of all sizes can innovate, compete, and thrive on merit in a fair and competitive online market. And the last principle we want to promote is that infrastructure is designed to be secure, sustainable, and environmentally friendly. Against this backdrop, the Declaration for the Future of Internet is a very powerful tool Following its launch in April last year, we already have 70 partner signatories and no others mine might join. This is a great achievement. I am pleased to see this process carry on in Kyoto. This event, co-organized by Japan, Kenya and the United States and the European Union, shows the declarations through global character and ambition. But Ladies and gentlemen, signing up to it is not enough. The value of the Declaration lies in our ability to bring its principles into life when we legislate, when we innovate, when we partner up with one another. This is not only a task for the signatory governments. It is essential that the multi-stakeholder community bring its perspectives and expertise for its success. We appreciate your contribution as the Internet Governance Forum community to the Declaration's com commitments, which also strengthens 
the multi-stakeholder model of internet governance. And we should use this opportunity to dive into each of the Declaration's promise. For instance, at the Internet, uh, Internet Forum 23, we are holding a dialogue around using technology to combat climate change. A key commitment of the signatories which holds enormous promise as we bring it to life. The EU will continue doing its part to implement and promote the declaration. Today, we announced the launch of a new 2 million euro initiative, the global initiative for the future of the internet, precisely with that very purpose. And my colleague, Pierce O'Donoghue, will share more details with you about this initiative. Where are you, Pierce? Here. I am confident that with the commitment of all signatories and stakeholders represented here today, we can use the declaration to shape the internet we aspire and we need to have. I thank you for listening to me and wish you a successful event this morning and a fruit and fruitful internet governance forum week ahead. Thank you very much. Great, I would now like to welcome our co-organizers to please come up to the stage. And we will be having one additional co-organizer join us momentarily as well. But we will go ahead and get started in the interest of time. And first, I would like to welcome remarks from Yuichi Aida, the Vice, Assistant Vice Minister for International Affairs from the Ministry of In Internal Affairs and Communications of Japan. Please, Mr. Aida. Okay, good morning, uh, everybody, and good morning, Her Excellency Vice President uh, Europa, and uh, Mr. Davidson from NTIA, and Mr. O'Donoghue uh, from uh, 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 European Commission. Uh, let me talk uh, 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 while sitting. And it is my great pleasure to have uh, uh, all of you joining us uh, today uh, to discuss uh, the, uh, uh, the future of Internet. And uh, uh, I, would, uh, it is, uh, uh, I would like to extend my uh, highest gratitude to the colleagues uh, uh, from US government uh, and the European Commission and the uh, uh, representative from Kenya uh, to, to, uh, in prepara uh, preparing uh, for this uh, uh, wonderful session. And also I would like to send my uh, uh, special uh, thanks to Ms. Jai Sharae and uh, Ken uh, Mel, uh, who, who have been leading the preparation for all the for, for all, all process uh, up until now. Actually, Japan uh, has been one of the uh, major members uh, uh, from the launch uh, of uh, declaration uh, on future of internet. And uh, we have been putting the highest importance on this uh, initiative, which is protecting and promoting free, open, and global internet. We strongly believe and committed to the democratic value, and uh, we strongly committed to promoting the internet as the basis and foundation for the democratic society and open and free economy. And that is exactly the core value of UN Internet Governance Forum. So uh, this year, as the host country of IGF, we have been trying to find what would be the best way, most uh, effective way to promote the value of internet and uh, uh, we strongly believe uh, this initiative is one of the most, uh, st uh, 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 most powerful instruments to promote uh, internet uh, as a global uh, foundation. As 
some of you may know, uh, Japan is also taking the uh, presidency of uh, group of G7, and uh, we, ha uh, we hosted the uh, ministerial meeting among uh, digital, uh, technology, uh, digital and technology ministers in April. And there, uh, we also highlighted the importance of internet governance, uh, along with other agenda items such as AI and data flow and the importance of resilient infrastructure. So the ministers agreed uh, on the importance of internet governance, and ministers found the importance of promoting this initiative of DFI as the very strong instrument uh, of internet governance. And they also agreed the importance of multi-stakeholder approach and also the collaboration uh, with other partners beyond the G7. That is why we wanted to, to host this very important session in IGF. And uh, this is exactly what we have been dreaming over the last uh, year or so. And we discussed among uh, uh, Mark and uh, uh, leadership panel members uh, what would be the theme for uh, 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 this uh, year's uh, Internet Governance Forum. And uh, we agreed, uh, Internet uh, we want. Empowering all people would be the good message to the world. So this means Internet is a foundation for society and the economy for everybody in the world. And to realize that uh, the discussion and the efforts among uh, all stakeholders in multi-stakeholder approach uh, is necessary. And Japan is strongly committed to multi-stakeholder approach. And uh, we, would, uh, we, we are strongly committed to promoting this very important uh, uh, concept and uh, initiative uh, in the discussion of Global Digital Compact, which is coming up very soon. And also, uh, we are, are, are supporting uh, the uh, promoting and protecting uh, multi-stakeholder approach in the discussion of upcoming WISIS Plus 20 in the next two, few years. So I strongly expect uh, this session is a uh, beginning of this year's annual, uh, IGF annual conference, which is promote, promoting the importance of multi-stakeholder approach and uh, uh, facilitating the collaboration between different communities from different uh, uh, countries so that the DFI uh, will make uh, further progress uh, across uh, uh, the uh, global partners and uh, will be uh, supporting the discussion at Global Digital Compact and uh, make a good preparation toward the discussion at uh, WISIS Plus 20 in two years. So thank you very much, and uh, I look very much forward to the productive discussion today. Thank you, Mr. Aida. Next up, we have Alan Davidson, the Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Communications and Information and the Administrator of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration from the U.S. Department of Commerce. And my boss. Over to you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you, Jaisha. And uh, thank you, Assistant Vice Minister Ida, uh, for hosting us and for those very, very important and thoughtful remarks. Uh, but really, thank, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I am delighted to be here to talk about how together we can advance the Declaration for the Future of the Internet. Uh, most importantly, we are here to engage with this community, this broad set of stakeholders, to discuss how, together, we can work to realize the core principles of the Declaration. As you all know, last year, the United States joined over 60 global partners in launching the Declaration to affirm our commitments to a single global internet that is truly open, free, interoperable, reliable, and secure. 
That commitment was so important because we continue to find ourselves in a global debate about what kind of internet we are going to have. Will it continue to be a tool for individual empowerment, economic opportunity, and innovation as it has been and as we hope it will be? What is the internet we want? The US government believes in building a better connected world, one that fosters open communications, enables access to information, promotes competition, protects privacy and safety, and uses technology to enable more people to exercise their human rights. The DFI is a strong statement of values by like-minded countries intent on supporting that positive vision of a better global internet. The DFI started as a governmental document that introduced what I think of as a, a known bug, right? It lacked sufficient involvement at the time from the multi-stakeholder community. There was a reason for that. Governments saw value in a strong statement developed and delivered fairly quickly by governments. But if the DFI is going to be strong going forward, we need the multi-stakeholder community to be behind it, to be part of it. So to move the DFI from principles to action, I would offer three key points for your consideration and discussion today. The first is that we are keenly aware that work towards implementation on the DFI principles cannot be achieved by governments alone. We need to work alongside civil society, industry, and the technical community, the user community, to achieve the collective goals of the DFI. And all stakeholders, but particularly civil society, should hold governments and industry to account, hold us to account, through the principles agreed to in the DFI. The US government welcomes this challenge from its own stakeholder community. A second point is that the IGF community is critical to realizing the positive vision of the DFI. We're delighted to be here. We've been talking about coming here for probably the full year that this <laughs> event's been planned. We will discuss today, uh, we need your input. What are your priorities? What can governments do to facilitate open, transparent discussions on realizing these principles? What obstacles stand in our collective way? We hope that everyone he here is ready to participate in today's breakout sessions, which we'll hear about shortly. We will discuss how to prioritize work on the DFI, how we can work with the multi-stakeholder community to operationalize the DFI principles, and how we should measure success. The last thing I'll mention is we, sh we would like to take this opportunity to share a document, which I think has been distributed, containing a set of best practices for consultations around the DFI. These were developed uh, within the US uh, with extensive input from US stakeholders, it's our hope that they are a useful tool or a starting point uh, for many to have these discussions. To close, I'll just say that the DFI, we see the DFI as a vital tool to promote our common vision of a free, open, reliable, safe, trusted, and accessible internet for all. Uh, as Vice President Yarova said, We'll only realize this promise if we bring these principles to life together. Launching this effort was so important, but it was only the first step. Now, with your help, we need to strengthen support for the DFI to fully realize its vision. Thank you. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Davidson. Next, we will have Pierce O'Donoghue, Director for the Future Networks from the European Commission. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> um, just a few moments ago, we heard European Commission Vice President Jourova, uh, so you don't need to hear too much from me, but it is a sign of how important the IGF is for the European Commission and the European Union, and even this session that we have a Vice President of the Commission here with us. Vice President Jourova's uh, words highlighted the urgency of our mission. And so building on her insights, I'm, I'm really honored to, to work together with our colleagues from the uh, other partners, the co-organizers, Kenya, Japan, and the United States. Uh, because as the Vice President emphasized, the Declaration for the Future of the Internet, it's not just a declaration. It's an open call to coordinated action. 
as she said, it's not enough just to sign. Signature is not enough. The DFI addresses the challenges head on and lays out commitments for action. And making those actions and the commitments specific will be a decentralized process, a bottom-up process, and as Mr. Davidson has said, one that crucially involves all the stakeholders, all of the partners in this multi-stakeholder process. And so it engages not only the signatories, but of course the multi-stakeholder communities around the world, starting here in the IGF. Now I'm actually convinced that all of the stakeholders will play their part in making the DFI a truly living movement. Again, as was just said, it started as a, um, a, 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 a declaration signed by governments, by administrations, but it only takes flesh and takes life with all of the partners fully involved. Um, as the Vice President said, as our contribution, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about the EU-led long-term initiative uh, that we are putting in place in order to make the principles of the European Declaration of Digital Rights and Principles and the DFI, which are entirely compatible, concrete and practical. We call it the Global Initiative on the Future of the Internet, which has three objectives. First of all, we want to raise awareness about the DFI globally, making sure people everywhere understand its significance. Because the Declaration is open to all, we aim to strengthen support uh, for the Declaration and to, to broaden participation, not only to new countries, that firmly dis decide to abide by the commitments in the DFI, but also to stakeholders around the world. Secondly, we actively support the implementation of DFI principles in the countries that have endorsed it. Obviously, that starts with our work at home to ensure that we are practicing what we uh, preach, that we are putting in place the protections that are necessary. So it's from government, but with the help of civil society to make these principles a reality. Finally, we will integrate the promotion and implementation of the DFI principles into our other external actions, again to ensure consistency and a cohesive approach. But what makes this project truly special is its commitment to a multi-stakeholder and rights-based approach. We believe, as do our partners, that the Internet's future should be shaped collectively with input from all corners of the globe and from all parts of society. As Vice Minister Ida said, we must ensure that using uh, the DFI, we work together as like-minded partners to influence the GDC and subsequently the WISIS Plus 20 process. And that's why today's event is so important. We led on a, a series of workshops held in Prague last year. Uh, we're now working here with our partners to continue that work, which is part of the commitment written into the DFI, not only to work with, but to draw from the input and include the stakeholder community. We'll be using that feedback from previous events and this event, uh, including today, so that I assure you in now the breakout sessions and working forward, we'll be listening carefully to your input from how we can together move the DFI further. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. O'Donoghue. So we will now be moving into the breakout session portion of this event. Each breakout group will have a moderator and a rapporteur. Now we are very pleased that we have rapporteurs from Youth IGF who will be participating in the discussions and who will be reporting on each of the breakout group sessions. So to provide a little more information about the expectations and what might happen during these breakout groups, I'd like to introduce Dr. Eileen Donahoe. So she is the US State Department Special Envoy and Coordinator for Digital Freedom in the Bureau of Cyberspace and Digital Policy. So please, Dr. Donahoe, please come on up. So it is really wonderful for me to be back in the IGF community with this multi-stakeholder community. I am brand spanking new in my role as Special Envoy and Coordinator for Digital Freedom for the US government. 
but I have been deeply involved in the global multi-stakeholder internet governance conversation, I'd say for the last 15 plus years. Um, I've been part of civil society, I've been part of academia, so I'm like many of you, sort of a strange multi-stakeholder animal. Um, and I've worked with many people in this room in many different settings, and it's really fun to see everybody. But I just have to call out the one person who's sitting right here in front of me, Wolfgang Kleinwachter, who I think of as probably one of the best conceptual minds thinking about internet governance from, from the very beginning, and it's very fun to see old friends. I also want to note that I happen to have been deeply involved in the DFI negotiations, but as a member of civil society and academia, really focused on the human rights part of the uh, declaration. Um, now it's very interesting for me to be in a different role as part of the government, as a representative of the US government. And my job is somewhat to help elevate the uh, potential and realize the potential of multi-stakeholder process in all of these global internet governance conversations and make it more real and results-oriented. Um, so this is the most important segment of this whole program. We are moving into the breakout groups where all of you get to engage with each other in your own groups. The request is that you attempt to cover each of the themes that have been laid out, and I am hoping the, the moderators and rapporteurs have this in writing that they can share with their respective stakeholder groups. The first one is really to focus on the substantive priorities that are most ripe for multi-stakeholder uh, progress. Uh, the second of which is thinking about um, Modality, modalities for cooperation that can be more effective going forward. And the third may be the hardest one, which is thinking about how to define and measure success. Um, I just want to reiterate, the governments that are involved in the DFI want to underscore and demonstrate their commitment to these high-level principles. And they also want to demonstrate commitment to this community and engagement with the multi-stakeholder expertise in the room. But the real purpose of this event is to get your help. We really need the expertise in this room to help us figure out what are the best ne next step for DFI. Uh, how can we turn the, the commitments to principle into policy and practice? And most importantly, we need help in implementing through concrete actions all of the principles in the declaration. So you are now off to do the most important part of this program for about 90 minutes, and then we will come back and have a full, full, fulsome readout from each of the stakeholder groups, and we'd like to bring them up to the stage here. Thank you very much. All right, so now we will cover some of the logistics and the next steps to move into your breakout groups. So we have decided to divide up by each of the communities. And so the idea here is that we want to hear from each of the communities and then come back together. It will be very interesting, we think, to hear where the communities align and diverge, and that will help guide our next steps. And so for those representing civil society, you will be joining your moderator, Grace Gitayaga, the CEO and convener of Kiktonet in workshop room eight. For those within the private sector, please join your moderator, Tamiya Suto, global digital policy lead of the International Chamber of Commerce in workshop group 10. For those in the technical community, you will be joining your moderator, Akinori Mamura, the chief policy op officer of JPNIC, in workshop group nine. And then finally, for those representing government, you will stay in this room, where your moderator, Patrick Pavlak of the Carnegie Europe, will begin the session shortly. So the way to make sure that we're gonna get to the rooms is we are going to have you meet in a specific 
section of this room so you can walk together so we don't lose anyone. So um, civil society will be meeting in the front. Then the technical community will be meeting in the middle towards the wall. And then the private sector will meet in the back of the room. Now, I'll also note, as I said up front, the goal is to listen to the stakeholder community. And so the government representatives are welcome to stay in this room and have that discussion. But we would also encourage the government representatives to move around to the other rooms, if you'd like, to hear what the stakeholders are saying. So in, momentarily, we'll move to the portions of the room. And then following those sessions, we will meet back in this room at 1130. And that's when we'll hear the feedback and conclude the discussion. And then we'll take a group photo. So please um, join your moderators in the sessions of the room, and we'll kick off. Thank you so much, everyone. OK, let me, let me start by explaining why we're moving here and why I'm using the microphone. And that's an important piece of information for you. Uh, this session is going to be streamed online. So uh, keep that in mind on. when we are engaging in our discussion as well. Uh, changes the format a bit. And that's the only session that's going to be also streamed online. So uh, it's important to engage uh, as well. There will not be any uh, comments on or uh, interventions uh, from the audience online though, so we will be just communicating one way. Uh, let me, I'm, I'm trying to place myself a bit strategically so that you all can see me, but maybe I should actually sit down somewhere if you, if you don't mind, I'll squeeze in here. Um, so uh, my name is Patrick Pavlag, I work for uh, Carnegie Europe, I'm a visiting scholar there, and I'll be your moderator for today. As you know, we're having um, three other parallel sessions with the stakeholder groups who are discussing how they can work better with the governments and how governments can engage better with their communities. Uh, what we're trying to do in this session is maybe do a bit a reverse uh, exercise. So how do you think you can engage uh, better with those different group of stakeholders? Uh, what are your expectations towards them? Uh, we have three sort of a blocks of, uh, of questions and issues that I would like to address, but before we get there, uh, let me also maybe uh, introduce the format very briefly. So we also have a rapporteur for the session, and he is uh, there, yes. Uh, Bibek Silva, who's a youth IGF representative based in uh, Kathmandu. He's one of the funding members of IGF in Nepal. Uh, and will be supporting our work. Uh, we are going to sort of collect these thoughts in a semi-structured format uh, in a document online. That's also to support our colleagues afterwards in preparing a collective report uh, for all of you to see what the different sessions have actually led to. Um, yes, as I've mentioned, this session is going to be live streamed, so welcome to whoever is uh, watching us online. Now, I'd like to maybe start by clarifying the objectives. Uh, yes, and I see some people looking at watches. It, it might be probably difficult for some time zones to follow us. So uh, I do not expect many people online, but it will be still recorded for everybody else to watch afterwards. Um, yes, clarifying the objectives of, uh, of the session. Uh, we are expected to generate substantive feedback to share with all other stakeholders in the planner group. So we will look really bad as uh, the government stakeholder group if we do not have anything concrete to deliver. So keep that in mind. At the end of the discussion, I'd like to have at least five concrete bullet points that we can present uh, in the plenary. And as I said, we will structure this around two big blocks, but three different teams. Uh, block one will focus on what do we want to achieve together? Which are the principles that should be prioritized for multi-stakeholder cooperation. I assume you all uh, remember those five principles, but if not, let me quickly recall them. The first one focuses on protecting human rights and fundamental freedoms. The second one on promoting global internet that advances free flow of information. The third one, advancing inclusive and affordable connectivity. Number four, promoting trust in the global digital ecosystem, including the protection of privacy. 
And the fifth one is about protecting and strengthening multi-stakeholder cooperation. So in this blog, I really would like us to discuss what it is that you think as governments that should be prioritized, which of those principles is ripe enough for cooperation with the broader multi-stakeholder community. And the second big block uh, focuses on how do we achieve those priorities. So what are some of the modes of cooperation that we can engage in or through with uh, the broader multi-stakeholder community? We have already heard references to Global Digital Compact, uh, WSIS Plus 20 processes. Are these the avenues that we think uh, w could be interesting to explore? Uh, for cooperation for the multi-stakeholder formats. And of course, we hear at the IGF, is that the platform um, that should be used? Um, and then in this same block, once we define what is it that we want to achieve, how we want to achieve it, I would like us to discuss a bit, how do we define the success? So how, in other words, how do we know what you have set out as the governments who have supported the declaration last year? is actually on track? Are we achieving the results? Are the commitments being uh, measured? And there we, of course, can have a discussion a bit about the transparency of the implementation of those principles and so on. So we have about uh, 90 minutes. Uh, we're going to move uh, in this block for different sections. I'll see how the conversation flows. On some of them, we may spend more or less time. Uh, and if I could ask you to keep your interventions brief so that we also have an opportunity for dialogue, that would be great. Uh, of course, uh, you're all the signatories of the declaration, but if there is some sort of um, a slight disagreement on tension maybe about how this could be uh, implemented, that would also be interesting maybe for people uh, watching online, but also for you as well uh, to have a debate. So let's kick off with uh, the first theme, which is the priorities. And the question I would like to ask you is, which of those DFI principles do you think is a top priority and most ripe for action by a multi-stakeholder community? Uh, I would maybe supplement this as well with a question, where do you think the involvement of multi-stakeholder community is most desirable and why, right? Um, what do you maybe think the expectation from the multi-stakeholder community is as well towards the governments? I'm sure you're engaging on those principles with your interlocutors at home. Uh, and then depending on how we, of course, um, move on with the discussion, I might add some additional questions. So who would like to break the ice and uh, kick us off? Yes, great. Uh, actually, oh, I think there is another microphone there, yes. Thank you. Um, I mean, all of these five are important, but the one that I would like to um, prioritize the most is promote a global internet that advances the free flow of information, because uh, there are other principles which are directly or indirectly connected to this. Um, and um, when we read about different laws that are enacted in different countries, certainly there are concerns raised. For example, I mean, in democratic setups, uh, people look at laws, uh, when they're enacting laws, they, they, they prioritize things differently. In other setups, it's different. But when we talk about the internet, we are talking about uh, a global regime. I mean, a free flow of, flow of information, it should be everywhere. Um, so recently, um, I mean, um, one law that has been enacted in the United States is the Restrict Act. And there are concerns that, you know, how it's going to affect um, a different um, aspects of the internet. Then uh, there are talks about digital sovereignty and there, there are talks about fragmentation and how information is going to flow. There are certain laws that are quite restrictive when we talk about cross-border data flows. So all of those things, I mean, we need to look at them and we need to come up with an approach so that these concerns are, um, you know, um, uh, addressed. Uh, because free flow of information and open internet, that, that is how it was originally envisaged and it was, it was designed in such a way that it's open and it uh, gives equal opportunities to everybody and uh, information is democratized. So I think that is quite an important aspect for me in my opinion and we can certainly have a discussion on it and 
listen to uh, what everybody else has to say. Thank you. Uh, do you also mind when you take the floor introducing yourself very briefly? So uh, that my uh, name is um, Ali Sahibzad Ali Mahmood. Uh, I'm the managing director of uh, a government organization that is mandated to uh, digitally transform the province of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa in, uh, in Pakistan. So we are involved in policy making um, regarding um, how the digital transformation should look like. And we are also involved in um, regulating access and all of those aspects uh, to the internet. Great, thank you very much. Thank so a free flow of information, uh, one of the principles that we already have on the table. Any, any other takers? Okay, perfect. Uh, so let me start with the lady and then. Thank you. My name is Zena Buharb. Uh, I am head of international cooperation at Ogero Telecom, which is the incumbent operator in Lebanon. Uh, actually, the priorities uh, here regarding the principles it depend, uh, depend on the situation of each country. For example, from uh, where I come, uh, we have, a, a, we, we have a, a huge problem in connectivity. Uh, and, and it's related uh, uh, mainly to the uh, situation, the economic and the financial situation in Lebanon, in addition to other uh, uh, crises like power, because uh, sometimes in Lebanon, we, uh, the internet uh, is not uh, cut because the government wants uh, to, uh, to uh, just to uh, disconnect the people, but because we don't have uh, power to run the network. You know, that's why with these problems, the priority for us is the network, is to, to have the, to, to give the access to, to the people. So, um, and uh, all, the, all the, the principles are very important, but this is the main, the major issue in Lebanon, and this is uh, our priority. So the connectivity and the access. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bert Teuermann, uh, Cyber Ambassador of Austria. It's interesting when I had to look again at the principles of thinking which can be put ahead of the others, and it's very difficult. So I would have, and also in light of the statements that were made so far, I mean, all five of them are extremely important, and maybe we also need to differentiate. Uh, if we look then at country level, it really depends on the specific situation. But even there, some principles, they are interconnected. You, for free internet, you need human rights observance, you need multi-stakeholder involvement. So you, it's not one above, totally above the other. But I do agree, you, probably what we should differentiate and say at country level, an assessment needs to be done with the involvement of multi-stakeholders. What are the key priorities if you have some sort of priority setting among the five? And then you can say, look at regional level, and then you go above. If you look at the global level, I wouldn't want to put one ahead of the other. Because, for instance, when we talk later how we implement the principles of the DFI, for instance, at UN level in the Global Digital Compact, we need to, we need, all five are important and equally important. So maybe that's the type of differentiation we need to make, uh, to make. Otherwise, it would be quite difficult somehow, and I think the country level is particularly important. Thank you. Great, thank you. So I think you're already pointing out to, um Two conditions that play an important role when we talk about the implementation or putting the principles and the commitments into action. On one hand, um, uh, what you have flagged is this idea of the potential impact of the external regulation, for instance, and different trends in other parts of the world that are not necessarily under the control of your own government that might impact how those principles are being enacted. But at the same time, I think you also pointed out to a very important uh, aspect that it's not just about the willingness to implement those principles, but the capacities to implement them. Uh, and I think there we need to have an important conversation as well. You know, when we looked, for instance, at how the government's commitments are translated into specific policies and actions, that sometimes the fact that something doesn't happen doesn't mean that the governments are not really committed, but they simply may not have the capacity. And there is a second point to that that it's actually not always about digital. Sometimes it's very much linked to uh, 
the infrastructure, uh, connection to the energy and networks, availability of the energy, right, in the, uh, in the first place. So I think these are all important uh, aspects that maybe we have to keep and add as a layer to the conversation about um, the principles that are in the DFI. So thank you for these, uh, these two interventions. Uh, yes, yes. Thank you, Patrick. Um, also for kicking us off in, uh, in that way. I'm Regine Greenberger, I'm the German Cyber Ambassador. I would like uh, to counter your argument a little bit uh, because governments, I mean, we are not advocacy groups for a specific purpose or for a specific principle. So in general, we have to take all five principles as equally important and we cannot afford you know, to, to choose one of them or two of them uh, just because uh, this kind of, you know, fills our, or meets our needs for public support, for example. So this is, uh, this is really a challenge, but um, I think we have to look at it on a global level, of course, like Bert said, but also on the national level, we have to see how we can implement all, all five of them. If I had to pick uh, one to comment a little bit more in detail on, it would be the digital trust uh, principle, because here we, sh we, we see that for governments, um, the, the challenge for governments lies also in conflicting targets. If you look at, for example, at uh, combating cybercrime, which is a prerequisite to creating digital trust and can be done only by governments. But here you have, of course, um, the the conflicting targets of, on the one hand, you know, safeguards for the innocent and safeguards for those who are, uh, for example, political, politically dissenting from a government's opinion, and on the other hand, the necessary competences and tools for, for the security institutions. So this might be a conflicting target, but the overall uh, principle of digital trust has to be met somehow. Another example is uh, AI regulation. Of course, governments are looking for um, consumer protection and want to regulate AI applications for that purpose. On the other hand, they may cripple innovation by doing that. So uh, the principles are, you know, when, it, when you break it down to the concrete set of tools that is at hand of a government, like regulation, governance questions, or also engaging in the public debate, you have this. You have you have to meet these challenges of conflicting objectives, and I wanted to flag this for our discussion. Great. Uh, anybody else? Yes. Uh, do you have a microphone? Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Alan Davidson. I spoke earlier from the uh, Department of Commerce at, in the U.S. government. And uh, this very interesting conversation. I just add uh, one thought. The, um, they say, uh, there's a saying, it is very difficult to choose between your children. Uh, and it's not usually recommended. Um, <laughs> uh, I, th I think we are hearing and actually listening, it shows that we, we ha there's a lot of reasons to be looking at each of these principles. It may be, as, uh, uh, as we heard from our colleague, that it depends a lot on what's happening in a particular region, in a particular country. I will say, for example, right now, I'm spending a lot of my time in the US uh, focused on this connectivity issue because uh, we have a lot of people left behind, believe it or not, in the US who are unconnected, and we're thinking quite a bit about how do we get to the next billion people online in the rest of the world, uh, and working with many of you on that. But I think, the conversation here today is a reminder that in different places at different moments, each of these children will be very important to us. And I think we, we just know, should know we are going to have to work on all of them uh, is, our, is our view uh, uh, going forward together. I agree, but I think I'm going to start pushing you back. So uh, okay, maybe let's this hear is, it. Maybe this is why I maybe this is why I got hired to do this, uh, this moderation. So I agree with you. You know that's why you have signed the declaration because all of those principles are important to you. However, you need to start somewhere, right? You need to prioritize, and I think this also goes in the direction of uh, Regina's remarks. So I'm pushing back here there. Um, the governments have limited resources. Uh, you know, you have a limited number of staff, uh, you have a limited budget. 
Uh, in principle, yes, all of them are super important. You know, we want to have access, we want to be cyber secure, uh, we want to cooperate with multi-stakeholder community. But then when, you, when it comes to regulation, for instance, you know, you will not engage in regulating all of them at the same time. You would probably prioritize one over the other, right? Or when you uh, do the hiring decisions, you would also probably put more resources towards uh, one principle than the other. This is how we could actually measure whether you love your children equally, you know. Um, so I think there is certain hierarchy uh, which is motivated by something uh, and maybe teasing out what motivates it and I think we have heard here one of the arguments it's basically our capacity to implement. It is our needs, which could be linked to access to energy, for instance. But there might be also some geopolitical considerations, for instance. Some of the principles are very clearly linked to progressing digital authoritarianism, right? And the idea of pushing back against those. We see proliferation of... Uh, technology that is potentially insecure and exposes our societies, which is also something that the declaration aims to push back. So do you see, um, so I'll go back to the initial question. So after this, do you still think that all of them are equally important or from the US perspective, there are certain principles that you actually love more than, all, than the other children? My wife would and say which I one, not And answer. which ones? <laughs> I think the interesting thing for us, and I, I say this having followed the, this space for some time, there w I think it is very right. There will be moments when uh, of opportunity or also of particular challenges where we know we need to step in on particular issues. And it will vary depending on our place and our view of the world. Domestically in the US, for example, we are doing a huge amount on connectivity. That's an unusual thing for us. Five years ago, we would not have said that. We have resources, we're doing that. Globally, I do think this question about um, new technology and this question of well, uh, AI and others, also the question about um, authoritarianism versus uh, open and free, openness and freedom is very much on the table and so perhaps you know, when we think about the uh, global situation right now, really principles one and two are top of mind for us uh, as well. Um, great, there we, now we have a debate. Uh, so there is uh, an intervention here, there. Um, thank you, Eva Gondoshenko from the Department for Science, Innovation and Technology in UK government. Um, I, I agree with a lot of what the other speakers have said. But I think from a UK perspective, we're very uncomfortable saying that one of these principles is more important than the other, meaning we're going to deprioritize some of these priorities. And some of the things we haven't mentioned is human rights and multi-stakeholder participation. And I think the reason why is not that because we don't care, but it's because they are about how we're going to achieve all the other principles. And I think we, we can't just see them all as equal. And I would slightly disagree with the idea of children um, because that means we're all looking at them in separation. And actually where it comes really together is seeing how they all link together. Um, we agree, even in a developed country like the UK, um, connectivity is really a really important issue. When you think about the voters, what they care about when they look at politicians in a in technology department is who's going to bring them the best connectivity and reliable internet access. But as soon as you connect them, all the other principles will come into play. And you can't just say, well, we're gonna connect people first and then we're gonna think about what they're gonna do online and whether they're going to be safe. So we think it's, it's not about this principle is more important than the other, but they are, they are different, they have different nature. And some of them are more about the what, or what, what do we actually need? We need freedom of information, we need um, sort of access and, and connectivity, and some of them are more about the how, and that's where the multi-stakeholder participation in particular is of utmost important to the UK in particular, because how are you going to do any of that if you're just ignoring the stakeholders, just kind of getting through the principles, and then at the very end we're thinking about, oh, what might stakeholders think about that? Well, you thought about it too late. So I think we need to see them in how do they connect, and therefore there might be a priority in that sense, but we don't think that you should deprioritize any of them and just... Um, sort of leave that to later when, when you have more capacity to pick that up. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe this is where we should have started. What do we mean by prioritizing, right? Because I think you're pointing to 
a very important element, which is sequencing and interconnecting those different principles. And let's not forget, we talk about five, but if you look at those bullet points under each of the principles, you have 23 very concrete actions uh, that you have identified as actually the priority already. And I agree with you that probably it's quite difficult to say, you know, that uh, focusing on uh, cybersecurity is maybe more important than ensuring that uh, we have free flow of information and that it, this is more important than the responsible state behavior in cyberspace, right? Because all of those uh, come together, but some of them are almost enabling principles or commitments for the others, and I think maybe this is uh, how we could think of them. Okay, we have a gentleman over there and then a lady. Uh, thank you, Richard Winier from the department, um, we're actually the Department of Infrastructure in Australia. Um, so I think I just want to sort of perhaps muddy the waters a little bit or make the world more complicated but agree with um, some of the other government colleagues that have spoken. I mean in some respects I think well, this is, for those of us that work inside governments, the world is messy, ambiguous and constantly full of trade-offs and we're constantly agreeing to lots of things that seem inconsistent or impossible to do um, simultaneously. Um, but so, I mean, I'm a little bit in the territory of you shouldn't have favourite children, but on any given day you probably do have a favourite child. It just is a different favourite child every day. Um, but I think actually some of the points that um, you were talking about from the UK's perspective are really quite important. There is a sequencing piece. There's no point... You know, if you don't have connectivity, there's not a lot of point in sort of helping worrying about how it's going to be used by people, for example. There, are, there is a sort of sequencing piece. But there's, more so, there's also an interrelationship piece which goes to, I think, the first principle around fundamental freedoms and human rights is possibly relevant to how you go about approaching any of the principles. Another way of thinking about it, I suppose, from my perspective as a government operator, if you look at it through the lens of what can governments do on their own, as it were, there are some that jump out faster than others. And if you look at things that can only be done with a broader multi-stakeholder community, it might be a different thing. So connectivity is something that we're worried about in Australia as well. So there are lots of governments that are investing. It is a thing government has within its gift to resource and effect. And so looked at through a government lens, you might go, we are throwing more resource at the connectivity piece, but that's because in a sense it is a piece in the sort of capacity of, um, of governments to give if they decide that that is a public policy problem they wish to focus on. So I think, unfortunately, there is no, depending on how you look at it, what's most important or what's most controlled by one stakeholder group, you could come to a conclusion we're working harder on that principle over another, but it's not to say it's more or less important. Um, so an interrelationship, a sequencing piece, and also a set of choices based on where you come from in the system, I suppose. Great. So uh, even though you don't want to prioritize, I think that we have a certain prioritization happening when you talk about where the government's attention is going, and connectivity is definitely one of those principles. And I think it's actually important because if you think, for instance, of how you potentially grow the community of countries that are supporting the declaration, connectivity is definitely one of these aspects that is relevant for a much broader group than uh, just uh, people sitting in this room. Um, I would also like to maybe ask all of you to um, reflect, since you do not really want to think about which, uh, which is a priority, uh, where are we actually maybe not paying enough attention? Because uh, we already hear about where the actions are going, where the governments are focusing. Uh, but where are we actually not looking? Which of those principles you think that maybe is a bit of a neglected? I don't want to go into parental uh, uh, metaphor and continue with this. I don't want to say an orphan if you want. Uh, but it would be interesting to hear where do you think we could potentially maybe want to increase our efforts? Uh, we have an intervention as well. Uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, Anna Neves. Uh, I'm from Portugal. I'm uh, from, uh, uh, from the Ministry responsible for the digital affairs. Um, and But I'm here under the chapeau of, uh, as uh, the current chair of the CSTD, uh, which stands for the Commission on Science and Technology for Development of uh, UNCTAD, United Nations, and uh, that deals with uh, uh, the WISIS Plus 20 process. Uh, nowadays, it is one of uh, our most popular <laughs> themes in the CSTD. And um, I'm not going 
to, to, to say anything about the prioritization of these uh, uh, five principles because I think that they are all very important. My main issue here is another one, is uh, how we involve other governments and different go governments on this declaration and uh, with the uh, ongoing discussions of the global di digital um, uh, the cooperation, uh, sorry, uh, compact of the GDC. So we have on one hand the global digital compact, we have on the other hand this declaration, how they, uh, uh, they complement themselves, how governments they see these, these movements, uh, because of course governments they have different speeds um, on these different uh, principles, but what has to be agreed is if these principles are agreed by all governments in the world, and so we are under this discussion nowadays with the Global Digital Compact, and then with the, the, the WISIS Plus 20. So I think that this is the basic. So um, I'm really worried about uh, going back to the basics and uh, Pierce uh, from the European Commission um, uh, is, uh, uh, last week we had a meeting and I was talking about uh, going back to the basics because I think that after the WISIS plus 20 and with the Global Digital uh, Compact, I think it's time for uh, everyone and for the governments in the world uh, to have the responsibility and to be accountable of what is going on on the internet and what we want uh, for the internet of the future. So this is more comments than anything else. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. So you're already pushing us a bit in the discussion about how indeed, uh, but there was also one hand raised to, uh, on the priorities there, there too. So a um, uh, gentleman in the front and then uh, right behind you. Uh, indeed, so I'm uh, Tom Fifield from the National Institute of Cybersecurity in Taiwan. And uh, just going back to our Australian friend's uh, comment from earlier about sequencing, uh, I believe the reason that we invest in internet infrastructure is to support the passions of our 23 million free democratic citizens. And that's the fundamental thing that we're looking to support. That's the reason why we need to build a resilient internet, why we're building 700 satellite ground stations to make sure everything's fine if the, sat, uh, the submarine fiber optic cables uh, get cut. It's the reason why we're looking at AI safety. It's the reason why we're working on disinformation uh, on online platforms when it comes to our election system. So we have that fundamental uh, freedom uh, piece that I, I think is the most important and everything else is done in support of that. It's working. Thank you. Good morning to all. This is Ganesh. I work for the government of Nepal, uh, especially the Prime Minister office. Uh, regarding to the principle to practice of the uh, that we are discussing, there are some of the key issues that is particularly related to developing countries and specifically in Nepal. The first thing is about the issue of accessibility, inclusive accessibility of the internet infrastructure broadly related to sustainable electricity supply, ICT in infrastructure, broadband technology, as well as computer and smartphone. While talking about the inclusivity, we should not forget the remote and the rural areas. And the next thing is the affordability. As the LDCs have low income, although there is a reasonable access to internet, but the cost of the internet, as well as the mobile phone and computer, is so high that we cannot afford the general public, student, as well as the rural remote and the uh, farmers cannot access those highly high-priced 
uh, internet infrastructure. And the key issue for the government of Nepal is also the legal infrastructure, especially focusing on the cyber security, e-commerce law, as well as the uh, governing electronic transaction, personal data protection, privacy, data privacy, and information security. So we need to focus on that. And what is the purpose of internet? Of course, it should be directed to enhance the quality of life or promote the economy. If so, application of ICT technology into business and commercial purpose and economic activity is, should be the key issues how the people can get their livelihood through the modern technology. So th we should have some divert issue that should be access to all so that the digital literacy, especially the economic digital literacy is very, very important for the developing country. So my concern as well as request to all of us is that we need to have uh, some common area of cooperation to minimize the digital gap among the world. Uh, I think the targeted in investment in ICT infrastructure, mass scale digital literacy, and the supplement of the rise of digital platform, and the use of some of the common platform to promote the capacity of the government as a private sector is the key issue right now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. So um, I have an intervention here, here, and then here. So three, and I'll slowly start wrapping up the priorities part. So uh, if you still had something to add in this specific blog, uh, feel free to raise your hand. Otherwise, we we'll slowly start moving to how, how do we actually uh, do it. Manuel de Costa Cabral, um, from uh, Portugal as well. Uh, I'm from the uh, Electronic Communication Regulator. Uh, so for me, uh, as we are working internally, uh, connectivity plays an important part. Uh, and uh, I wanted to bring you a, a special case that we are working on in, in Portugal. And uh, for us, it's important um, at this moment. And it thinks, uh, I think it, it, it is a practical example of these principles can apply to reality. So, submarine cable strategy. Uh, so, it links, obviously, to connectivity. Uh, uh, but then, one of our main concerns is how to protect such infrastructure uh, in terms of physically and, and also in terms of the data that is flowing. Um, so this links to connectivity and then to trust, uh, and also obviously to uh, data flows. So we have several principles when we are laying down this strategy, you have several uh, principles that are being applied. Uh, and of course we are working with several partners, those little links to multi-stakeholder uh, partnerships, and obviously we have uh, all uh, uh, these uh, higher level concern about human rights and how to protect uh, our citizens uh, um, in, in several ways. So this is a practical term of, of how these principles can, uh, can be applied, and uh, my take here would be um, uh, actions and concrete examples are uh, as important as principles. So uh, I think the trick is, and you were asking about what we are missing, perhaps we are uh, missing this bit which is coming to uh, concrete uh, things and uh, turning into reality some uh, principles that we are working on. Thank you very much. No, that's, uh, that's a great intervention and I think you're pointing us in the um, a direction of something we, we have been discussing as a potential follow-up to this specific exercise, which would be exactly trying to collect different examples of where the principles have been used or sort of incorporated as a guidance for specific 
policy solutions in the, adopted by, by individual governments. So expect some homework after this specific workshop because we didn't necessarily want to end up with the exercise of each government reporting on how they uh, um, implement their principles and what they do, but we would like to indeed end up at some point with um, potentially a list of what each of you is doing in your respective countries with regards to those principles. So um, uh, stay tuned. Uh, Piers, over to you and then a gentleman. Over. Thank you very much. Piers O'Donoghue from the European Commission. Um, very interesting discussion so far. I, I would say about prioritization, Perhaps my experience of parenting isn't as positive as everyone else's, but uh, I often feel that uh, it's not so much which child you love, but which child is the most problematic at the moment. Uh, and that's where my focus goes. Uh, so what are the real problems that I have to tackle at any one time? Um, with that uh, slightly, not cynical view, but uh, world-weary view, uh, I think it is the case that, of course, we're not going to pick and choose but we, ha we do have to look at what is uh, very challenging. And I, I really like what's just been said when we look, for example, at the connectivity piece, because another way of looking at all of these principles is that they refer to the role of government as government, their responsibilities in their country, but also working together. What are our global responsibilities for each of these five principles? So on connectivity, of course, any government will naturally be focused, first of all, on connectivity at home. But what is our responsibility, our role, but also our possibilities for cooperation? Uh, in Europe, we have the Global Gateway. We'll soon be announcing an initiative on, on the security of cable networks, undersea cables. That's for our own good, and it's also for connectivity to others. If we are to support connectivity in partner third countries, we need to have that. Um, and uh, this brings me to a, a more fundamental point about how they are, as has been said, and uh, where I would like to leave the prioritization, how the interplay is so important. If we have no connectivity, or if we have very, very restricted connectivity, then we are playing into the hands of those who would control the internet. And this is why we're also with partners, we're looking so much about uh, trusted uh, vendors and making sure that the equipment, the services, the infrastructures are actually trusted and can be trusted. Moreover, if we engage in promoting investment and deployment, what we are doing is we are removing one of the bottlenecks which becomes a point of control. And we are seeking to remove controls from the internet. If access is a premium, then we are playing into the hands or we are forcing the user who needs that access to accept whatever is the, um, whatever are the protocols, whatever is the structure of what is provided. And if worse again, the access equipment or networks is provided miraculously at a cost which defies any logical business case or cost structure, then we have to be very worried. So that is why we have to put a massive focus on international connectivity and helping partner countries to actually roll out that um, uh, connectivity and access, not to just to the next billion, but increasing it in volume. So, so, so that's one perspective I have. We can't talk about trust, we can't talk about a global internet, or even, of course, protecting human rights, unless we have that. So I understand why it's fundamental, but let's change the emphasis slightly. And, and not just be inward looking, but also outward looking. And then a final point, I'm sorry for speaking for so long, because we're here in the IGF. The fifth principle is one that perhaps hasn't been on our minds as much recently, but as I had occasion to say already, we are coming towards the GDC, the our, uh, our Futures mm -hmm. Summit, and then the WISIS Plus 20. And I think that we will need to look uh, a lot more, give more priority to promoting the multi-stakeholder model. And here there's a little warning, because we are being looked at and judged as well as government, that we must ensure that we are telling people that we are doing that not because we are creating a separate structure. The DFI cannot be seen to undermine or compete with the WISIS process or the IGF process. It has to contribute to strengthening the role of government in protecting the fundamental rights, human rights, and in supporting all of the other pieces where governments do have a key role, including and in particularly trust, in order to allow the multi-stakeholder model to continue to be at the forefront of everything we do. And of course, 
unfortunately, as we move to a process which is, dare I say it, more New York-centric for the next 18 months, that the multi-stakeholder model is core to that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, so these interventions have actually already brought to uh, the conversation what we really want to explore a bit more, which is how the multi-stakeholder community fits into the equation. And it's part of the, uh, it's one of the principles, multi-stakeholder cooperation and strengthening those ties. But it's also uh, the method for implementation of some of the principles, right? So again, if you think about connectivity, which many of you have used, uh, all three other groups that are discussing uh, those principles are actually quite relevant, whether it's the private sector, technical community, or civil society, they all have a role to play. So one of the concrete maybe takeaways would be uh, to maybe think of how can we look at the specific principles and unpack them a bit from the perspective of where different communities make uh, contributions so that in addition to, for instance, a very useful um, good practice document that the U.S. delegation has shared before when it comes to engagement with multi-stakeholder community, we also have this growing body of uh, evidence that actually multi-stakeholder co uh, cooperation works towards the achievement and the implementation of the, uh, of the principles. Uh, over to you. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mahesh Pereira, representing uh, Information and Communication Technology Agency of Sri Lanka. Uh, I look at it uh, now, uh, when it comes to my institution, now we are into empowerment of citizen. You know, my business is empowerment using digitalization. So we consider internet as an enabler. Enabler on top of which we build solutions to empower government, to strengthen the government and to empower citizen and to improve competitiveness in businesses. So when it comes to the local context, now there are multiple challenges. So, I mean, undoubtedly these principles help us, you know, uh, uh, doing our business better to empower, you know, all sort of uh, and strengthening all sort of stakeholders. But there are local challenges when it comes to connectivity. I mean, naturally, I mean, being a developing country, as my colleague mentioned, the trust on the government is not that strong. You know, I mean, the trust is a uh, great uh, blocker when it comes to do certain empowerment initiatives. So, uh, so internet, I believe, must be an enabler to build trust because the government needs to be trustworthy so that people can trust the government. And uh, so if internet could be an enabler to build, improve trustworthiness of the government, I mean, that's an enabler so that, I mean, we can, as a, as a global initiative, if these principles, I mean, undoubtedly, as I indicated, those, these principles are quite relevant. But how do we make these principles, uh, uh, principles applicable to various uh, geographies. Now, when it comes to uh, United States, I mean, when it comes to Sri Lanka, the applying these principles may be slightly different. So how we are going to create an enabling environment so that these principles are applied equally in irrespective of local context. So there could be, uh, I, mean, I mean, we could help each other uh, improving uh, or creating a conducive environment where these principles can be applied irrespective of local challenges. And there could be certain tools that we could make available so that the, the countries could make use of these tools uh, so that these principles are you know, ap uh, applied irrespective of their local challenges. And uh, so I, I hope this DFI will, will focus more on these concerns and come up with the uh, right recommendation uh, to deploy, apply, adopt these principles uh, in, uh, in, in multiple democracy, uh, I mean the democracies as well as multiple demographics, irrespective of their local challenges. Thank you. Sorry, can I, can I ask a follow-up? Uh, what tools specifically would you have in mind that the DFI could provide that would serve yeah. that Now, purpose. when it comes to the local context, now we have already implemented Data Protection Act, and we are in the process of drafting online safety bill at the moment. It's been debated in the country whether government should, I mean, when it comes to social media, so social media act as a barometer, it, the country needs social media freedom so that people can express their views. And on the other hand, government must have some sort of control over social media and the internet. I mean, there are good players as well as bad players. 
so how we are going to regulate it? So how, as a community, global community, can help those countries to manage? Because it's all about governance. I mean, you need data, you need good quality data. It's all about governance, safety, security, procedures, practices, all these things must be in place. It's free, but it's not free for the sake of uh, having freedom. It, it must be governed, it must be uh, uh, controlled to a certain extent, but without affecting these fundamental principles. Okay, so if I understand correctly, we're also going a bit in the direction of potential regulatory capacity building, rather that the governments could sort of uh, engage in and the assistance they could provide each other exactly to make sure that the regulation that is being passed sort of uh, f matches the expectation that the DFI uh, um, uh, puts forward. This regulatory uh, dimension actually came up in a couple of interventions as well, so I understand that for countries who are on the way of adapting their legal systems exactly towards those new digital technologies, um, how to navigate those different policy dilemmas and challenges is something important. Sometimes there is maybe not a full understanding of what the policy implications might be. So uh, indeed the FI and its community can become an interesting uh, sort of a vehicle if you want for uh, having these conversations and exchanging good practices, for instance. Um, okay, let me, let me move uh, to the next the big uh, segment that I would like to discuss with you, which is the cooperation modalities. And I think uh, here we're already entering a very practical question that our colleague from Portugal has already raised and, uh, and uh, appears in his intervention that on one hand we have uh, this question mark, how does DFI fit within the broader discussions about global digital compact um, with this plus 20 process um, uh, summit for the future? And as Pierce said, we do not want to give the impression that this is a competing process, that this is something on the top right. So how does that fit? And I am pretty sure that the discussion in the other three rooms is also going to go in that direction where people will be asking, okay guys, so you had this great idea, DFI, now how does that fit within all other processes that are currently underway? and then how multi-stakeholder community fits in. And in some of those cases, uh, it ha will happen naturally, you know, at the UN, there is an engagement with the multi-stakeholder community, but what else can be done, for instance? What is your strategy in preparing for those different processes for the engagement with multi-stakeholder community locally or regionally, and how you intend to take those voices on, um, uh, on board? Uh, also, please feel free to answer uh, the Portugal's question about, well, what do you guys make out of it? How are you going to organize yourselves to talk about DFI, uh, GDC, and prepare for all other processes coming up? So if you feel like you would like to share your experiences as well, uh, please go ahead, but also uh, talk a bit about how your engagement with uh, the broader multi-stakeholder community looks like around the principles that we've been discussing. Accessibility, for instance, uh, regulatory adaptation, and so on. Who would like to uh, kick us yeah. Okay, thank you. If I say uh, uh, certain things that are happening in, in our country, now we are drafting a new strategy, strategy for 2030, digital transformation strategy, so which has six trust areas. One is the broadband connectivity, about uh, digital data and services infrastructure that is having the uh, you know digital ID and the the the, the middle part of between government and citizen, and then cybersecurity, uh, the capacity development, and national payment uh, digital payment platforms, and uh, and about um, building ecosystems, uh, digital ecosystem. So all these uh, trust areas will basically touch upon on these fundamental. Uh, principles of uh, uh, improving uh, and having uh, better connectivity, having uh, a trust between, uh, you know, you know, I'm, yeah. Okay. Now, <laughs> it's about, you know, uh, improving these fundamental uh, principles, what we have been discussing here. Uh, so it's about strategic approach, mm -hmm. having strategies in place, and having uh, multi-stakeholder involvement to implement those initiatives to address those concerns. Mm -hmm. 
So you have, uh, so you're thinking of multi-stakeholder engagement at this stage of implementation. Um, Are you involving other stakeholder groups as you develop the strategy as well, and how do you actually do that? What is the role in this process? What kind of, uh, what, what are the contributions uh, that they make? Yes, I'm also from Sri Lanka. I add to what you said is, for example, the development of the cybersecurity policy recently. We had earlier the five-year strategy, and now it led to the policy adopted by the Cabinet of Ministers. It went to a wider stakeholder consultation, now uh, basically focusing on the implementation in the, in, the, in the public sector, the government sector, in which the, all the measures for the physical as well as the online safety of the internet, uh, critical digital infrastructure is going to be defined. Uh, so, so there's the custodianship of the government, as uh, Mr. Mahesh mentioned, uh, about the data. Uh, the, another interesting model of uh, cooperation is the domain registry of Sri Lanka. Uh, it's a, it's a multi-stakeholder model. It is, there's no high uh, government engagement. There is a uh, somewhat uh, uh, flexible arrangement of academic uh, private sector as well as some little engagement of the government. Uh, so we, uh, in, in the international context, I think we have to bring in some other players into the scene like ICANN. So there's another track going on the universal acceptance. For example, the, uh, the, when it comes to the internet, it should no, not be uh, internet of uh, one particular language, or it there should be uh, multiple languages, and there are some compatibility issues and acceptance in, in certain uh, technical terms. So there's a uh, universal acceptance is also going on. So, so I think there will be a high level of government engagement in the, uh, that part is somewhat uh, weak from my end. I, I was in GAC for a little uh, certain period. By my term in the in the government uh, that ministry the, of digital infrastructure ended, and then after that, uh, it is it, it did not continue well. So as far as, far as I know, so there should be high level of uh, participation of the government players in the in this uh, uh, some, somewhat technical standards in in in, in, in the internet governance uh, domain. So as we think about the. Um how the governments could arrange their cooperation with broader multi-stakeholder community around the principles. I think one issue that I would maybe like you to um, talk about a bit is, you know, what model do we see for this cooperation? So for instance, does the group think that moving forward it would be interesting to think about some sort of a centralized governance structure around the DFIs and the engagement of multi-stakeholder communities. So, you know, whenever uh, there's an opportunity to have a sort of, yeah, um, centrally driven, let's say, uh, engagement, or are we rather thinking about more distributed, fragmented, sort of a patchwork of engagement with multi-stakeholder community around the different principles at the national level, at regional level, or whenever there is an opportunity. So in other words, using the DFI as a sort of a hook for engagement in the existing fora, rather than maybe creating another big central structure that would sort of provide this layer of formality to the discussions about the DFI, but maybe be not necessarily manageable uh, and very resource intensive. So if you have some thoughts on, uh, on moving forward, that would be also uh, great. So I see one intervention here. You also. <coughs> Sorry, so yes, okay. go ahead. Uh, Alison Aldrin, United States Department of State. Yeah. There we go. Alison Balzer, the United States. One thing that I'm hoping to get out of this is very simple, is a phone list. Sometimes trying to figure out who you're coordinating with in New York, in Geneva, in Kyoto, it's hard just to track the people down. If we can coordinate, use the DFI as a mechanism to coordinate with our like-minded people and find the right person before we go to these events, sometimes that's half the battle. Uh, so hopefully that's an easy do out that we can, we can look to for this. Just to clarify, when you say to find the right people, uh, do you mean the governments or a broader multi-stakeholder community? Broader multi-stakeholder community, I imagine, or, yes. or both, yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So uh, I believe everybody, <coughs> sorry, everybody agrees that all these principles are important. And in the regional context, 
one may prioritize one principle over another because the situation is different. Um, uh, there are so many factors at play. But while we're discussing these, I think we need to look at these. We're looking at these in the global context. That's why we are uh, getting opinions from all the stakeholders. So I believe, um, you know, the mechanism has to be somewhat centralized to ensure that, um, you know, whatever, whatever happens in one country, uh, it can impact maybe, uh, you know, uh, other countries as well, the kind of uh, uh, maybe the legal framework that is enacted or maybe the kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, other laws that are enacted in that country. So it's just a matter of addressing the issue of, uh, you know, your child not beating up the child of the neighbor, you know, that, that needs to be addressed. So that whatever, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's it's, okay, thank you. So um, I think a centralized mechanism should work better if we have to look at everything in a global context. Thank you. Uh, also, what I would be interested in is if any of you actually feel like you maybe do not have or get enough support from other stakeholders in your work? And, it's, and it might be the case, you may not actually have the civil society that's developed in a specific policy area uh, to support you in the implementation of the principle, which would be interesting to know because there exactly this <coughs> linkages between different countries that might have uh, specific expertise could be uh, could be explored. There are countries that do not necessarily uh, have this ecosystem of organizations that are relevant, so feel free to also share those thoughts. Uh, I have a gentleman next to me and then. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Narayan Timilsina from Nepal. I'm working in Ministry of Communication and Information Technology there. Uh, so, so joining with the previous uh, priority part also, so I, I'd like to add some few words. Uh, basically, as we discussed here, that every country have their own priorities. Uh, 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 in context of Nepal, I think there are two things that uh, we should prioritize on uh, here. Uh, one is the free flow of internet, which connect with the accessibility and affordability part also. Because as we have rural infrastructures and very difficult terrain, so affordability and accessibility is a key issue. Uh, and joining this, the digital trust in ecosystem is very uh, cr critical part there. As we are moving to build some legal infrastructures, uh, the, like the protecting the cyberspace uh, and protecting data, uh, personal data, okay? And other like the social media, uh, not regulation, but some sort of control uh, is a good debate in our country. And uh, joining this with other principle also, we have some uh, issues like uh, there is trade-off uh, when we talk about the uh, uh, digital trust and, uh, and also the human rights and freedom of internet. So uh, how we can properly address the legal aspects uh, and just uh, make them in a balance that we, we can make balance on protecting human rights, free flow of information, and then and regulate uh, or the control the, the, these sort of activities. That's a huge concern. And, and my concern is uh, that how, if we, it is possible that these multi-stakeholders community can work together, uh, as he, this gentleman uh, here said that the centralized approach could be good. I, I also agree with that. Uh, if we can have some uh, the centralized mechanism that would support the country like uh, Nepal uh, to go and implement these sort of things, uh, and have a, some balance on these things because uh, it's very terrible that we, 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 if we go for uh, a regulatory mechanism, uh, there, there are some human rights uh, or uh, freedom issues. So that's, that's the debate, yeah, what I can so Can I ask you uh, a quick follow-up on okay. any of these points that you have uh, presented right now? Yeah, yes, uh, on, uh, on any of the points that you have uh, presented, have, has your government engaged with private sector, technical community, or civil society organizations to seek some help, or that has not happened for one or the other reason? No, we, we have uh, different uh, local uh, sectors, yeah, uh, some uh, digital rights activities and, and just uh, digital Nepal freedom peoples. 
we are also here in this uh, conference also they are working uh, but uh, for from more from international uh, perspectives yeah we have to work a lot on this uh, i know we, we have some people from uk here also that uh, uh, when we go for data protection and privacy issues yeah it's it's it's, it's, it's a very important issues and uh, implementing gdpr in their country also they, they have some uh, critical yeah, uh, the, this uh, issues they, they, they it has been raised so that can be so some guiding point for a country like us uh, who, who, have, who are not in, uh, who have just started the debate there in our country. Thank you. Um, on your question of cooperation modalities with market stakeholders on the DFI principles, yeah, I mean, for me, there's a bit of a question, namely, whether we should have sort of standalone processes around the DFI, whether we can really we have the capacity to do so, uh, both at national level and globally, or whether it's about integrating sort of the principles in our engagements that we're having. I must say from our perspective, where resources are, are relatively limited and everyone is super busy, we are a bit concerned about setting up separate tracks. We have already too many tracks almost, uh, I remember when the DFI was discussed originally, the question was the relationship, for instance, with the Freedom Online Coalition, which has clear structures of government and multi-stakeholder collaboration. Uh, so we would not want to see sort of another sort of track which would deviate attention. So we see it a lot rather of how we integrate it in existing mechanisms. Just to give an example, um, because on, on the different aspects we spoke, we have different at national level and also beyond different formats of collaboration. For instance, when it comes to cybersecurity, we have a very well established public private partnership where we bring all the private actors together and we work together. And we can, of course, you take DFI principles into account. The same on artificial intelligence, you have processes, etc. Um, we used, for instance, for involving multi stakeholders in our preparation for the global digital compact. We, uh, the main avenue was uh, was the national IGF, uh, and they drafted an input to this process, and we want to continue to use that framework for that type of discussion. So also when it comes now to the global level, I'm really wondering what's, what's the best advice, because I have a bit of feeling we are sometimes struggling that uh, it's, statements are being drafted in so many different fora, and you almost can't cope anymore. And we're almost often also among like-minded, too much deviating or fragmenting our efforts instead of, yeah, the overall objective should be then, we come to this measuring success, that for instance, the processes that we are now having, the Global Digital Compact next year, etc., are reflecting the DFI principles, um, and that they are fully reflected there, that's for us much more important than having another event on the DFI, to put it very as in a simplistic term. Thank you. Like this, okay. Thank you so much, uh, Jorge Cancios with government. I just was triggered by by this mention to where to to have these discussions and uh, um, uh, considering the the different needs that are uh, varying uh, depending on your national reality or and your regional reality. I think it's important to, to use really the network we already have of uh, national and regional IGFs. And uh, I think it's, this is uh, the, the right way of doing it. What you have done today is to, to have it here, to have this discussion here. And of course, uh, at the global level, the IGF offers also other, uh, let's say, tailor-made uh, avenues for cooperation. You could think about a dynamic coalition, a best practice uh, forum, uh, other, other means that are more, uh, more stable, more intercessional. And you have that, of course, at the regional, at the, at the national level. And that's, uh, that would also be a way of showing the relevance of this forum, of, of the IGF itself and especially uh, considering the discussion 
uh, we are having or we will be having on uh, what happens after the Global Digital Compact, uh, because there we will be having a, a very similar uh, discussion. Do we need something new to, to have the follow-up and the periodic evaluation of the Global Digital Compact, or should we use this, what we already have, perhaps with some adaptations? So maybe that's a, a worthwhile thought for for this uh, initiative as well. Thank you. Good point. So, UK, then a colleague over there, and uh, Portugal. Thank you. Um, clearly sparked a lot of thoughts here, which is great to hear. Um, I want to agree with a couple of the points made on the previous interventions. Um, we definitely agree from a UK perspective that there are already a lot of mechanisms. And I think the reason why we come up constantly with new mechanisms is because we feel like the existing ones might not deliver to the fullest but from a UK perspective, we do, we do think we need to look at what are the things that aren't working for particular stakeholder groups and how can we improve those in the existing mechanisms rather than trying to invent new ones in the hope that there will somehow be the silver bullet solution to that. Um, and in that, I'm thinking of very basic challenges that international organizations are really picking up on. The fact that right now we're having this discussion in English only, there's no translation, and uh, there's reasons why the IGF can't facilitate um, translation of all different sessions, but language barriers are a real challenge for a number of stakeholders internationally to participate. Times or differences you mentioned, a lot of people might not be able to zone in, they might be able to see what we're talking about, they might not be able to engage in it, and we're having a discussion with, but amongst governments only, um, I think we would have been in favor of having multi-stakeholder breakout groups, but I can see the um, benefit of having a government-only discussion, of course, as well. Um, so for us, it's really about how you make it easier for stakeholders to engage. In the UK, we're very lucky that we have a very engaged stakeholder community. You asked about, do you lack civil society? Absolutely not. And they really established trusted relationships, and that's probably an area where other countries might struggle in, in building that trust where you don't have, you might have the civil society community, but, but they might be very antagonistic because of various historic reasons and how do you build that trust. Um, that's something where we are trying to showcase what good practice looks like. We have multi-stakeholder um, delegations to the International Telecommunications Union, ITU. Uh, we have multi-stakeholder advisory group in UK for internet governance. We do have that very regular exchange and this is why, where we can be confident in our policies that we develop and then the solutions. Um, but for implementing the DFI, I, I want to go back to a point Alan made, Alan disappeared, I'm looking at an empty chair there, um, about a challenge function. And I think this is actually where the DFI is really interesting in, this is governments committing to specific actions and how can we hold ourselves accountable and how can others hold us accountable? I don't think there's any mechanism that really provides that systematically. And we are concerned observing some of the developments on the Global Digital Compact that was mentioned a lot on multi-stakeholder engagement and consultation, but not multi-stakeholder participation and, um, and act to sort of eye to eye um, involvement in the process that it could well become a sort of another governmental process where afterwards you're being told as a, as a, a stakeholder, this is what governments have agreed is now going to happen. And I think we are, we really need to rethink how that's done. That's not how the internet works. How do you involve users as well? There were discussions around that on Global Digital Compact. Um, I'll stop there, but, but I, I think those are really important things for us to think about. I'd like a short of hands of people who still would like to intervene because I have one, two, uh, three. I'll take those who have not spoken, if you don't mind. Uh, also, because we have uh, 15 minutes left and we still need to wrap it up a bit. I know that you guys don't want to talk about how do we measure the success, but I will still make sure that we uh, discuss this very briefly. So, uh, a colleague over there. Thank you. Um, my name is Elisa Hever. I'm uh, from the Netherlands uh, the Dutch government. Um, yeah, thank you, first of all, for this interesting discussion with signatories of the DFI already and maybe some new signatories uh, here in the room as well. Um, I um, Also, I, I heard some people or some countries uh, speaking about an international or a cyber strategy and how it's being created. Just wanted to point out that the Netherlands uh, recently published their international cyber strategy and yes, it's available in English, so... Uh, everybody can look it up and uh, we have a, a full chapter about um, um, uh, internet governance and the multi-stakeholder model so a lot of our thoughts have been uh, portrayed in that chapter. 
Um, and in the DFI, um, um, well, it's already been mentioned that there are the five principles, and they are accompanied by 23 action points. And some of these action points are formulated to refrain from certain things, and um, such as undermining the, uh, undermining the technical infrastructure to uh, the, global, the general availability and integrity of the internet, or refrain from government-imposed um, uh, shutdowns. And I think it's really important that we also, I, I would just really want to stress these uh, uh, points, because I think that's something that we as a government really can um, act upon by actually not acting upon. Um, and, um, um, it's, yeah, so it's something that we should adhere, adhere to. Um, what I do agree with some other colleagues is that it's still a bit fuzzy how the DFI fits into the, the broader discussions amongst, uh, with the, D, uh, the GDC. Though I do agree with what others said is that it would be nice if some of the principles uh, mentioned in the, D, uh, in the DFI would be adopted or transposed to the GDC, such as what I mentioned, the, the refraining from certain actions. So that are my two cents. Thanks. Great. Thank you. So we already have, I think, two points for the, uh, the success uh, factor. So I'm already uh, noting those down. One was, uh, indeed, if the principles are taken over in other uh, documents that are being discussed, like Global Digital Compact, uh, but also, uh, and that's relatively easy, easy to monitor, uh, is actually, the, you know, monitoring these commitments where the governments have stated that they would refrain from doing something. That's also something that can be uh, easily monitored and then uh, have these uh, governments potentially accountable in the, in the next meetings. Um, uh, a colleague here and then intervention. Yes. Is it working? Thank you. Um, Irina from Germany as well as my colleague Greg Ine, there from the Ministry for Digital. I would really like to briefly echo what has been said that we should harness as much as we can was it there already in terms of dialogue formats. Uh, and for example, we in Germany are reviving or revitalizing now something, uh, a regular exchange that already exists with multi-stakeholders under the roof of the IGF Germany. And we're going to do that on various issues. So there, well, as we have discussed with them already, there are probably some themes that will come up, come up all over again. But then we also want to discuss things that are, yeah, just uh, very relevant at a certain moment when for example, certain decisions are about to be made. Uh, so we also intend to discuss the Global Digital Compact there and also talk a bit about the process and, and how, we, how we negotiate there uh, when it comes to, to state, interstate negotiations. So this is something we, we should definitely do. We are also having a quite broad stakeholder involvement uh, for the strategy for international digital policy that we are current, currently developing and we want to continue that even after the strategy is in place and we implement it. Uh, and so I definitely think this is a good idea not to come up with too many fora but to try to integrate it into existing fora that already work uh, and work well. And uh, also with regard to the different processes that have been mentioned, um, of course they are different in many ways and they are leading to different decisions but in terms of substance, there are many, many areas that are overlapping. I mean, many of the topics that we have been discussing in the first part of the session are also relevant in many of these other processes. So maybe we look a little bit more at what the substance is and not so much how it is framed in the individual process. And I think like that, we can really develop a, a, a dialogue that is important for all of these processes and also try to bring them together and make them coherent in the end. Great. Thank you. So we have about eight minutes left. If I could ask you to be brief in your interventions, um, that would be great. Uh, yes. Perfect. I think yeah. it's working. Yes. Uh, this is uh, Neelam Nagar working uh, for a think tank, uh, which is affiliated with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Pakistan. So as, uh, as you mentioned that, uh, what are the cooperation modalities that uh, are already uh, in place for countries uh, around the world? Uh, as, far as, as far as uh, Pakistan is concerned, my other colleagues have already mentioned that uh, when it comes to, uh, because the government approved the national cybersecurity policy in 2021, so I, for a fact, can say that there was a lot of consultation process 
uh, going on uh, with the, because I work under the Ministry of Nas uh, Foreign Affairs. So with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of IT and Communication, there was a lot of back and forth going on on the national cybersecurity policy, which was finally enacted by 2021. So uh, in that policy uh, draft or framework, there is a, there's one whole uh, section which uh, identifies the multi-stakeholder consultation, not only at the local level, but also at the, uh, the global level with the UN, non-UN agencies, that how these multi-stakeholder uh, consultation is, is, is important uh, in order to bring uh, a, a, a framework which is uh, important for the, uh, the overall processes. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, yes, so we'll go to you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so very quickly, we, we have been talking about this process and uh, we all agree there are too far, uh, far too many processes and uh, the more you dig into it, the more you find processes, whether here in uh, New York, Geneva, where else. Uh, and so perhaps a practical a proposal for this DFI is to, uh, to work on a mapping of these processes. Uh, we need several highs to, to keep a track on all these. Um, and uh, about multi-stakeholder, yes, we are working uh, in Portugal, the, uh, the Portuguese IGF, uh, and I can talk also about that. And so we are trying to engage more multi-stakeholders into the process. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see that our gr other groups are briefing on our neck already. So uh, one intervention here and another. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, just uh, a recommendation that, okay, uh, regarding some of the principles, I think some countries are doing better than other countries, and we can certainly learn from the best practices that have been adopted and the reasons why they're doing better. So going forward, I think if we can have uh, some sort of a scorecard and if we have a centralized, you know, um, uh, entity for oversight and review of what's happening uh, regionally in different countries and if we can have a scorecard then we can have a better uh, assessment of the situation and how we can make things better. Uh, I think if, if we have to make an analogy, uh, you know, something similar is the sustainable development goals, uh, you know, by the UN because if you look at the different goals and if you look at uh, them in the regional context, again, all of those goals are important. But, you know, if you look at different regions, the situation is different. So there is a mechanism for oversight uh, and, you know, certain interventions are made in different countries so that we are able to achieve those goals. So similarly, since all of everybody agrees that all of these principles are important, so if we can have some sort of a scorecard and then there is the centralized entity which can, uh, you know, do the oversight and review mechanism regarding the laws, the processes, the, the digital transformation strategies in different countries, and if there are certain uh, issues that are pointed out or highlighted and a way forward is given by that uh, committee, a centralized entity, I think that would be really helpful in taking this cause forward. Thank you. Great, that's a great suggestion. I think for some of those principles, what we could also think of doing is actually look at the existing indexes, for instance, and how those could potentially be referred to the principles without necessarily creating the new mechanisms, but that's a, that's a great point. Yes. Thank you, and just really briefly, it just seems to me there are a couple of different sorts of conversations we have going on, and sometimes clarity helps, and I think it's a little bit picking up what the UK said. There is a difference between when we are, it sort of comes down to what do we mean by we in these conversations? Is it a case of we, the governments, doing things in our countries, consulting broadly with a multi-stakeholder community in our country, which is very different from being equal partners with multiple stakeholders in a process? And I think there's also perhaps a difference between what is what we all agree we are doing as governments inside our countries and what we all agree we want to do cooperatively as and between countries at the international in the international context. And perhaps that raises a different question about whether we are doing things consulting with or sitting eye to eye with the various stakeholders. They're kind of two different concepts and I think we end up using them a bit interchangeably and when we talk about we, sometimes we're talking about we as national governments and other times we're talking about we as the community more broadly. Great, thank you. So let's move very quickly for two minutes to the question of uh, how do we actually know that we're delivering and different ideas have been proposed. The uh, idea of a scorecard uh, that you have put on the table as well potentially as well as an accountability, but also, frankly, the uh, 
capacity gap identification mechanism, I would also argue, so it's not only a stick, but also a carrot potentially when you look at the implementation of the principles. Is there anything else that, that you can think of that uh, this community could use towards tracking the progress and the implementation of the principles? For me, it's, I mean, we should play the facilitation role. As my colleague just mentioned, I mean, the balance scorecard, similar to UN eGov Development Index, where we measure each government progress on e-government. I mean, we fairly uh, strongly use UN e-government index uh, to measure where we stand. So similar to eGov Development Index, if we could make use of some sort of a balance scorecard with the, I mean, measuring is the key here. You know, you have certain parameters and you need to measure it, then only you can uh, you really know where you are and what needs to be done when it comes to local context to adapt these principles. So that approach will definitely help all of us to uh, understand where we are and to, to take actions to move into the next step. Thank you. Great. So uh, we are one minute before. If there are no urgent uh, interventions that you'd like to make, I also want to give you a 15-minute break before we reconvene. Uh, there are a few points that I'm really taking from this conversation. Uh, I understand that uh, when we talk about priorities, uh, maybe we should have really started by what we mean by this e prioritization exercise. And I think some of those uh, principles are definitely much more mature um, and implemented than the others, but also maybe more uh, ready for uh, engagement with multi-stakeholder community, and we have heard a few examples. I take away as well the need for uh, thinking about local context and how those principles can be potentially adapted uh, to the local context and how that needs to be reflected in our thinking uh, about them. We haven't really talked much about, we had talked about the Global Digital Compact and uh, the Summit for the Future. We didn't really talk about potentially the role of regional organizations as a vehicle for um, using the DFI principles as a sort of a guidance in, uh, in the policies that are being uh, made. If we think about specific mechanisms, I think the capacity building uh, came up on a few occasions, especially in the regulatory context as several countries are struggling in trying to figure out actually how to uh, govern and uh, regulate some of the issues that, uh, that we've been talking about. Uh, a few specific ideas on how do we measure the success as well. So do the principles that we talk about and that the 70 signatories have uh, signed up to are also being replicated in a broader international context like Global Digital <coughs> Compact or uh, in other international conversations that potentially can be taken on board as a... Um, uh, as a sort of an impact factor, if you want, for uh, for the DFI. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the other groups also came up with an uh, equally wonderful suggestion. I'm hoping that they will have a lot of guidance for how the governments can engage with multi-stakeholder community. Uh, and one final point I would like to make, having worked both with governments and uh, different stakeholder groups over the past years, what I've noticed, and this is my plea as well, is that sometimes for organizations uh, with international status, it's much easier to get access to governments in Sri Lanka, Argentina, or Pakistan than it is for the local civil society organizations. So when we talk about opening the doors for multi-stakeholder community, please keep in mind it's not only those big names working internationally, but most importantly as well, uh, those organizations that you have in your national and regional ecosystem that you should keep open communication channels with. And with that, I'd like to thank you for all your contributions. Uh, I'm hoping that this is not the last time we're reconvening to discuss the uh, DFI and implementation. I'm taking on board as well the idea of the scorecard and uh, holding you accountable to how you implement and refrain from doing certain things. So uh, we will be back to this conversation. Thank you very much and we will convene half past. Okay, we are back in a plenary session together, and this should hopefully be the richest part of the entire program because we're going to be.
bring together the different strands of conversation that just took place. And what we're going to do is hear from each of the breakout groups, the moderators who served in the breakout groups, individually for up to 10 minutes. Um, and then we, if we have time, we'll open it up to comments and questions from anybody in the audience to clarify things. And then we have a special closing guest who will be introduced. Um, so the first group we'll hear from, based on preferences up here, is the uh, gov government workshop. And we'll hear from the moderator, Patrick Pavlak. Great, thank you very much. So um, I also would like to clarify that the reason why I speak first is not because we think that the government's breakout session was the most important one, not at all actually. So we took the, the least important one first, if you want, uh, because this is all about the multi-stakeholder cooperation. Now, um, our session was also um, recorded and live streamed, so you will all have a chance to uh, watch it afterwards. I will focus only on key most important points so that you also are um, interested in watching and reading the final, uh, the final report. Uh, we discussed three uh, blocks of questions. One um, about the prioritization of uh, different um, principles under DFI. Uh, then we moved to potential uh, opportunities and platforms for cooperation of multi-stakeholder community, and then how do we define and measure the success, which I guess is something that all other groups were also discussing. Now, um, I must admit that the governments were a bit reluctant to uh, be very straightforward about which of the principles is the most important one and which one should be prioritized. But that's also understandable. They're the ones who came up with them and who uh, have adopted them. So as uh, someone in the group said, of course, it's important to love all your kids uh, equally. We have abandoned the children metaphor at some point because it was becoming weirder and weirder. So uh, uh, we've stopped that. Watch the video. You'll see at some point it became a bit dangerous. Um, but we did have an interesting discussion, though, about um, the fact that even though we don't want to really identify them very clearly, some governments actually buy where they focus their attention, which policies are becoming uh, implemented as a matter of priority, they de facto do certain implicit prioritization of those principles. And for instance, the focus on connectivity or uh, trustworthy internet, uh, were those principles that uh, clearly stood out in the, in the group as being implemented uh, by several uh, countries. Um, there are a few important takeaways in the discussion and the prioritization, at least for me. Uh, one, as uh, some of our uh, participants have stressed, sometimes it's not about which of them is more important than the other, but how do we actually sequence the implementation of those principles? Because some of them have this enabling or even a multiplying um, factor, if you want, when it comes to others. So you really have to look at the interconnection between different principles as well, not look at them uh, individually. And I think this was uh, quite important. Uh, another factor that was stressed was um, how do we actually make these global principles uh, suitable for local context? And how do we do this translation from global to local? Uh, I would imagine that my colleagues in the other groups had a similar discussion about how do we make the principles that were defined for the governments relevant for other stakeholder groups and how this dialogue between different stakeholder groups comes together. So I think uh, that was an important takeaway. And finally, in the part on the prioritization, something that stood out again to me uh, is the importance, uh, potential importance of capacity building. Uh, several governments uh, or colleagues have flagged um, different regulation, for instance, that they're working on in different policy areas that address the principles that are part of the DFI. But at the same time, they do not always have the capacity to uh, either develop those policies or implement them later on. And this was a very smooth way to transition to the discussion about the engagement with the multi-stakeholder community where those actors very often play uh, an important role. Um, what I've tried to get from uh, the group as well was what kind of coordination mechanism, if you want, we should uh, think of 
when we plan the engagement between the governments and multi-stakeholder community? Do we think of some sort of a new platform that centralizes and steers the engagement between the governments and multi-stakeholder actor community, or do we actually think about an alternative arrangement? And there was not much appetite for a co centrally coordinated mechanism. There was a feeling that there's quite a lot already happening and that rather we should be harnessing the existing mechanisms, so regional or national IGFs, for instance. Um, we did touch upon how DFI ref sort of connects and links to other discussions like Global Digital Compact. Uh, and I think the important takeaway from that discussion was that DFI should not be seen as an alternative uh, or sort of a, a parallel process that runs um, in competition almost to those other initiatives, but something that actually provides the foundation and, and complements them. And finally, when we talk about the success uh, of, um, of the DFI, how do we define it and how do we, um, how do we potentially measure it? Uh, one, uh, one indicator, if you want, that was put on the table was uh, the extent to which uh, the DFI principles are taken up by, uh, in, in other conversations. So for instance, when we move to a discussion about global digital compact, to what extent will the document reflect the, uh, uh, the principles uh, of the DFI? Uh, how, will we, how will we think about translating those principles into action? Uh, one of the colleagues also stressed the importance of um, those, let's call them prohibitive principles or actions in the, uh, in the DFI, where the states should actually refrain from doing certain things. Uh, and that actually potentially is um, a relatively easy uh, thing to monitor. And finally, um, there was an idea of a, what was called a scorecard, but the mechanism similar to sustainable development goals, uh, monitoring mechanisms that would sort of uh, allow the community to track and ensure certain transparency and down the, down the road accountability in the conversation about, about the principles. I'm sure that there are many more points that uh, people in the group found interesting, so uh, I, I invite everybody later to join the discussion and maybe reiterate some of those points. Thank you. Really excellent um, and succinct. I just want to underscore one thing, which it, tremendous overlap with civil society in, in that I, this group I was in, but um, also a little one theme I heard and what you said is a little bit of tension between government sense of responsibility domestically and what they're doing at home, whether it's accountability for those and metrics versus or intention with a little bit the goal of making these principles substantial in the international realm mm -hmm. and having to work on both parts. Yes, absolutely. This uh, did come up as well in our, uh, in our discussion. However, my impression is that there was really much more focused on localization and the discussion of how those principles actually um, fit within what the governments are doing. There were a few voices in the group who stressed that yes, while we think about the domestic level, we also have to think of what do we as international community want to achieve with those principles and how they contribute to our uh, common global effort in exactly ensuring open, safe, secure, free, interoperable internet, right? And uh, yes, I agree with you, there is a certain friction. I think it's uh, sometimes a matter also of uh, prioritization and the resources and where the governments focus their attention, primarily responsibility, is towards the citizens, so I think this is what some of the colleagues maybe were driven by uh, in their interventions. But there, there, there was indeed this slight, um, um, I, I don't want to say friction, but there is then maybe this idea of sequencing of where do we focus the attention first. Really excellent. Okay, so the next we'll hear from the <coughs> civil society group, and uh, this is Grace Gatanga. Uh, okay, um, I'll be reporting on behalf of the civil society group. We had a very efficient uh, rapporteur, Luke, um, who actually uh, summarized our conversation into 
into tweets before Elon Musk. Um, uh, just a few characters. So we also, like the first group, we had uh, uh, three key areas that we were looking at, uh, or three key themes. And the first one, we looked at the principles and in terms of prioritization. Um, and uh, very interesting conversations came up. Uh, the issue of access and inclusion kept coming up. And um, you know, we, we agreed that it can be they can be considered top priority. However, the issue of multi-stakeholderism uh, is key in entrenching um, and allowing for inclusion and for allowing access or allowing for the achievement of the other, uh, the other priorities. So that's how we framed it, that um, even, as we have, uh, even as we have identified those priorities, that uh, the multi-stakeholderism approach is critical uh, in, in, in allowing for the achievement of the, of the priorities identified. Uh, on theme number two, uh, on cooperation modalities, um, we agreed that um, there is need to implement the multi-stakeholder approach uh, with a bottom-up emphasis. Uh, and this can uh, support civil society, uh, project, agitate, uh, and um, stand for the global public interest uh, with effectiveness and efficiency in internet matters. On the third theme, how do you measure success? Um, and um, you know, the summary is that uh, success would be looked at when um, the DFI is globally uh, recognized across board and given legitimacy, solidity, and validity, uh, and especially where civil society concerns are, are, are you know, matter. So this, it should be able um, to support civil society work in consultations with all stakeholders and um, in terms of, um, in, uh, you know, minimizing the digital divide towards the better, uh, the betterment of internet. And the final takeaway, uh, you know, what do people know uh, about the DFI, the DFI and, um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, how does success look like? It's when we work with other entities, sorry, I, I come back, I think I confused there. Uh, the final takeaway about the DFI is that many people um, in the group say they, they heard for the first time about the DFI last year in the, in the IGF, and uh, there, has, there has not been, you know, a lot of mention about the framework, uh, even as a, as a point of framework of reference to mobilize governments, even by governments that have signed onto, onto this framework. So the IGF seems to be the only place where this is mentioned. So the recommendation is that we need to solidify the DFI. Uh, it needs to be entrenched in global internet conversations. And uh, the principles should become part and parcel of global conversations. For example, right now there have been com conversations about the global digital compact uh, that uh, the DFI uh, framework should actually be an automatic point of reference when those uh, conversations are happening. So let's make the DFI the, 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 the principle, um, you know, the principles work, and uh, let's raise awareness about them everywhere. And uh, they should not be seen as a competition uh, into other processes, but rather as complementary um, to implement what we are all working on together. Thank you. Really great, and again, what I'm hearing there is a bit of um, tension between what goes on domestically, in many cases not even referenced enough, and also this idea of not referenced across government agencies and when it comes to different types of responsibilities, whether it's national security, cybersecurity. Um, so it's a little bit pigeonholed um, in the domestic context, and yet tremendous yearning 
for international validity, that, that if civil society could have the DFI governments really push to um, pr give stature to these principles, civil society would take it and run with them in a lot of different international settings and a desire to work on that together. Uh, correct. I think there was also the the issue of um, that we must stop looking at government in a monolithic way. That government is broad. It's the judiciary. It's parliament. It's the you know executive. Uh, so that if you're having these conversations, they need to happen across all the arms of government. So that we are not just looking at one part of that. Has has not been socialized across government. Yeah. Okay, uh, next we're going to hear from private sector, and uh, that's Tamea uh, Suto. Thank you so much, um, Eileen, and, and thanks everyone, and, and huge thanks first of all to the private sector group um, that uh, really made my job very difficult, because you were very vocal and gave a lot of good input. Um, and thank you to Natalie for helping me um, make, make sense of that. Um, I'll try and, and, and summarize uh, as uh, briefly as I can uh, a very rich uh, discussion that we've had, um, which just hearing from my colleagues here, I think we've struck a lot of the um, similar points. On the priorities, um, it was very difficult to, to choose priorities, but I think the sequencing idea was also something that came up um, in our conversations in a sense of the base of it all is getting people online, getting all people everywhere online, so that, that's where we start. <laughs> um, but once they're online, there's, that's where the challenges start for all the different communities, um, for um, governments uh, to protect their citizens and, and, and shield them from harm, from, for businesses to, to protect their consumers, um, for um, users to, to have a safe uh, uh, experience online. Um, so we shifted into discussing once people are online and connectivity is there, how do we make that meaningful? But how do we make that trustworthy? How do we really ensure that um, trust is uh, that uh, that we're working towards um, in, in, in our endeavors? And we've uh, the private sector uh, conversation really pointed towards how the DS um, uh, the the, um, the DFI is there to to create some of that trust um, in uh, across. Uh, different uh, governments, across different stakeholders, um, and, and across uh, the internet. So from that premise, then we went into the operationalization question. Um, and there we've had a couple of themes um, discussing, first of all, uh, what are the challenges uh, for making uh, this trust happen? Um, uh, secondly, uh, what is it that the private sector can do to help, but also what the private sector needs? Uh, from the rest of the stakeholder community and from the governments. Um, so when we talked about challenges, um, we realized that there is um, a lack of information um, around not just the, um, the declaration for the future of internet, but the way we communicate about these issues uh, with each other, with different within stakeholder groups, um, and with the everyday uh, persons. Um, because uh, even we've had companies in the room who said, we're actually doing this, but we never thought about this, that we're doing it in the context of principle number X, Y, Z, goal number, uh, bullet point number, this or that. Um, so I think um, making that connection, we identified one challenge of making that connection between sort of this meta level of, of policy principles and then the the day-to-day -day challenges and, and substantive issues that we are always talking about and, and, and we've seen the news and in the media. And how do we make sure that that conversation exists and that we speak the same language uh, around some of these issues? Um, so from there, uh, we went, okay, how we, how we can make sure that, that uh, we spread this information, um, that we bridge some of this lack of information and, and, and lack of awareness, um, and what can the private sector do in that regard? Um, and that was where we came into the private sector networks uh, and how they can act as multipliers for the messages um, of, uh, of the DFI within their communities um, nationally, but across their networks with partners elsewhere, both in DFI signatory countries and broader. Um, 
and how that can act as, um, as a multiplier for um, those uh, communities that the private sector interacts with um, themselves picking up some of the, the elements of, of, the, um, of the, um, the declaration. Um, and from there, uh, really, we, we talked about creating channels uh, for input from, for the private sector into policy conversations. Um, and we came up with this idea that, that it needs to be a proactive uh, work from the, from the private sector side to share, here are the models that we think would work, here's how the policy system works in our country, this is the, the steps where we see that we could provide input, um, and this is where we want to work with other stakeholders, not just with governments, but with all stakeholders, to share how we can be part of this process. Uh, because ultimately, when it comes to implementation, which will oppose the operationalization of these principles, it will depend on the buy-in of all the different communities, private sector, civil society, technical community. They need to be there at the level of when we start talking about policy making. Um, and they are best placed also to share here is the ways um, that you can include us. So perhaps that is something that's necessary. Um, to make that happen, other things. We need clear processes um, to, to include multi-stakeholders. We need um, information sharing. We need capacity building um, across all of the different stakeholder levels um, to be able to understand what multi-stakeholder collaboration is, uh, understand some of these policy issues and how we can work with one another. Um, and also at the, um, at the end, we talked a little bit about, um, I think Patrick, you mentioned scorecards. <laughs> uh, we also talked about how do we make sure that this doesn't remain just a talk conversation, but that we assess uh, progress and we report. Um, and we ended up saying we need safe spaces for conversation where also best practices and implementation can be shared, lessons learned can be shared, but it doesn't become uh, you know, best in class list or worst in class list, but actually creating safe spaces where um, governments and stakeholders can learn from one another on how to um, how to progress this. So it's really the multi-stakeholder conversation was something that that was woven through all of this. And then on the last bit, um, in talking about successes, um, um, we've heard from Vera Yurova uh, at, at the beginning. Um, she said, um, signing is not enough, we need implementation. Um, and we transformed that into um, the number of signatories is not success. The, the successful implementation and, and is success. And we can measure that success and um, how many successful partnerships we've managed to do, uh, the stakeholders themselves, um, how, we, how did we involve them, um, did, did we put specific projects in place, with multi-stakeholders, um, with the private sector, to um, to progress some of these uh, principles that we've signed on to, and that's where we should measure um, the success. Uh, and then we talked a little bit about how do we um, channel DFI into other processes. And I've heard that all of you have mentioned uh, the private sector group agrees on the Global Digital Compact, uh, the WSIS Plus 20 review, how do we make sure that the principles are woven into uh, those conversations, but also how can the DFI itself be the channel for multi-stakeholder input into some of these processes? We're opening up now, um, this conversation is all about making sure that um, DFI um, is the true multi-stakeholder um, initiative. Uh, how can then this be a vehicle for multi-stakeholder input into uh, some of these processes that we're looking forward to. So, so things that strike me there, are a lot of similarity, strangely, with civil society in that emphasis on lack of information, lack of general lack of awareness of the DFI principles, even though they would otherwise be embraced and perhaps are in some regards already being implemented by the private sector but there is not this general sense of stature and using it as a point of reference. So that's shared. And then um, the desire to have more genuine opportunity and channels for engagement into policy. That same civil society would definitely seek that as it sounds like private sector. Correct. Um, and, and not just having that channel, but also building on what the private sector already has uh, going on that Kim be used as 
so not just learning from the DFI into the private sector, but the private sector being used as a multiplier. If, if you can make those connections, uh, because they exist, if you can name them, then that can actually act as a multiplier to, to make this grow. Oh, what they already know. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, last but certainly not least, we're going to hear from the technical community, which is the one most experienced in multi-stakeholder process, um, and Akinori Memura. Yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, the technical committee discussion was, uh, but I, I suppose that this is uh, quite shared with the other stakeholders, but this, this discussion was, uh, you know, we have the five principles. Uh, we, we uh, the, uh, Eileen uh, kindly uh, mentioned the three, uh, three or well, four discussion points, and then uh, uh, we, we tried to do that, do that in, you know, uh, to, uh, in a, in a in the recognition of the five principles and the three, the three, three themes, but uh, actually the discussion is uh, back and forth and intertwined, so it is really hard to, uh, uh, some, uh, something is uh, most important or something, but uh, I try. So uh, the, our, um, the, our discussion uh, start, started with uh, some uh, uh, the, the substantial uh, p priority, and then uh, the pri uh, priority, uh, this is a technical committee discussion, then uh, we, are, we are so committed to, the, the, to keep the internet up and running, and that's, uh, that's a principle number three, and then uh, that, that, was, uh, that was quite uh, the fo forecast, uh, the, the focus on, on, on the discussion. The, the, the another another point of the, the uh, particular focus was the uh, the encryption. Uh, for uh, this is uh, the uh, DFI principle number four says the trust and then the encryption is uh, the one of the very critical uh, tool for the for the in, 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 increasing the trust of the communications. Then it is uh, it is uh, particularly uh, emphasized uh, to uh, as as the important point. So uh, these are uh, these are the the the, the uh, priority from the uh, from the uh, from the DSI uh, DFI principles. The other part of the discussion mainly goes uh, for the the co uh, collaborative uh, the the uh, facilitation of co uh, what is it, what, what the, uh, co 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 uh, cooperation modalities. Sorry about that. Then uh, it's it's a qu quite a technique. Uh, this is the DFI. Uh, is the, the governmental declaration, uh, but uh, it is quite, you know, uh, the lead like uh, the technical committees, uh, the, the principle which we had been quite uh, believed, uh, we, we believed in and the, the practice. So uh, the, uh, at, at the same time, it, is a, uh, it, uh, the, it was pointed out that the quite importance of the uh, the uh, collaboration between the technical committee and the, uh, and the governments through uh, the sign, the, 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 this DFI and some other, uh, uh, even other the, the, the companies who are, uh, uh, you know, has a concern on, on the internet infrastructure. Then uh, the one, one of the discussion uh, was uh, uh, two or three things out, out of this. Uh, one, one is the, the, the existence of the leadership panel of the, of the IGF. It is uh, that really good, uh, uh, good place to uh, facilitate the discussion between the stakeholders, increasing the government and the technical committee, and then uh, that the dis discussion there is uh, quite uh, fruitful uh, to have the uh, share share the common understanding uh, among the the, uh, the stakeholders. The another point is that uh, uh, the, there there was uh, there was. Uh, uh, pointed out that uh, uh, Montevideo statement, which was uh, done uh, in uh, 10 years ago, uh, 2013. So uh, it is uh, uh, remarkably this uh, ten, tenth anniversary of the Montevideo statement, which is the, uh, which uh, appeared the, the uh, uh, much more, uh, uh, you know, uh, the adherence for the for the internet stability and the uh, movement for the uh, for the uh, IN, uh, stabi stabilization of the IANA function and then at, actually that was a very you know starting point of the the discussion of the IANA transition so uh, it it was a very good uh, uh, example of the uh, the technical committee to put the, the uni, uh, unified voice clearly to the to the other stakeholders, and then uh, 
uh, that was uh, uh, that was the uh, that kind of the uh, uh, clarity would be the uh, preferred for the for the, that that discussion. The another point is the GDC uh, Global Digital Compact, and then uh, actually we have the, some concern that the technical community is uh, not really uh, recognized uh, as much as we want. Then uh, <laughs> that's 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 uh, frankly then uh, that that would be uh, that uh, one 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 of the concern from the technical community and uh, but. Uh, but uh, with, 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 without that kind of the particular uh, point, point, pointing out that this is really, really important to uh, the, the other stakeholders, in, uh, especially the government, uh, is uh, quite a, a big interest and then uh, uh, recognition to the, the inter, uh, internet infrastructure operations, which, uh, which the technical community are the responsibly doing. Uh, that's, uh, and Another, another point, the measure, measurement of the success was uh, uh, discussed, and then uh, it is a little bit uh, not really clear, but uh, we, uh, we, uh, the, the, there were some points like uh, internet quality, accountability, uh, broader involvement of the various stakeholders, blah, 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 but not really clear <laughs> measurement was uh, pr proposed there. And that's, that's all from uh, my, my end. Thank you very much. Again, I hear so much support for the principles and this idea that you're, the technical community is already operating in ways that are consistent with the principles. Um, concern about uh, the adequacy of inclusion, even of the technical community going forward in multi-stakeholder process in places like the Global Digital Compact. And, um, you know, I'm looking at principle number two about protecting and promoting the global internet. I mean, the technical community is so important there. And if that is lost, it's sort of the, the whole thing is lost. So it's, there's tremendous um, overlap and unanimity, really, between the stakeholder groups, and I will even go so far as to say similar messages to the governments, to the DFI member states, because these different stakeholder groups are all really yearning to genuinely take this multi-stakeholder process to the next level, and the door is open, it sounds like, with all three stakeholder groups. So, let me now we have, I, oh, let, well, I guess we could turn it. Does anybody in the audience want to have, say something, comment on anything you've heard, question anyone, raise an issue that wasn't put on the table, any of the above? Even Constantinos? <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry about that. Um, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, listening to you, I'm wondering, you know, did this uh, didn't really come up that much in uh, in our group, but I'm wondering whether when we talk about DFI, we are going to see a similar split in how the governments perceive different stakeholder groups thinking about the processes when it comes to the implementation. So, you know, right now we all sit at the same table and there is this implicit assumption that the civil society is as important as technical community as the private sector. But we have seen it in other processes, especially at the UN, where actually the private, there was a push for private sector to be considered as a more important partner for the conversations than civil society organizations, for instance. Um, so I think that there is this risk that we have seen in other places that as we move forward, there might be there might be a push to let's say favor certain relationships over others. And uh, I'm not saying that that push was coming from the signatures of the declaration. Actually, quite the opposite. But I think as we are thinking about exactly how the principles can be internationalized uh, through other conversations, we also have to make sure that the principle five, which actually stresses the importance of the multi-stakeholder cooperation is also taken really very seriously and any attempt to sort of try to, let's say, divide and rule the multi-stakeholder community is really pushed uh, uh, against from the very beginning. Question here, I'm curious what people up here or the audience think about 
maybe pushing a little bit more on the idea that there are, are five stakeholder groups that should be part of the conversation in pretty much all settings. So obviously government, private sector, the technical community, civil society, and academia. I mean, that's one of the themes I've heard, and I think in unintentionally, at least, in some settings, the differentiation between what those different kind of stakeholder groups can add to the conversation is being lost. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's one thing this group might be able to advocate for together. Um, there was also the issue uh, <clears throat> of trust um, that we cannot be talking especially governments that have signed on to the declaration, um, there is the issue of trust that they have signed and yet they come up with laws that counter or undermine the framework. So that, you know, we, we can't be talking of this framework, the issue of trust, and then uh, the challenge of coming up with new laws. And that's a message to the governments that they must not undermine the framework. Governments themselves, yeah. And on, on the private sector side, we also had a, a lot of conversations on, um, on, on, this, on how we actually operationalize multi-stakeholderism. Um, and we, there was one very interesting discussion, I, I thought, when we said, we need to have a clear understanding in government and other stakeholders as well, on how technology, how this ecosystem works, and what is the role of the different communities in it, and not just the roles and their responsibilities, but also um, the capabilities that we can attach to them um, in this, we call it the stack of, <laughs> of, of, the, of the internet ecosystem. Uh, if we have a clear understanding on what is the role, the responsibility, and the capability of each of these actors, it's easier then to think about what kind of expectations we attach to them. Um, a lot of the times when we think about um, passing laws, regulating uh, these technologies, the first in instinct is, um, okay, who delivers them? Okay, so this is all going into the private sector. We forget that there's others in the stack. If it, if it th thinks about, okay, who's holding us accountable? Okay, it's, it's gonna be civil society. It's, we, first of all, let's not pigeonhole stakeholder groups into, into these categories. Um, and secondly, think about what is that they can actually do uh, so that, and if we involve that understanding and, and throughout the entire process of setting the policies, they're there, then at the implementation phase, you already have the buy-in, so it's very easy to start actioning. And you don't have to start it all over, you come up with the action and you think about who's gonna do it, right? So we can <laughs> do it the other way around. So, so I think that was, that was a, um, a clear message. And then the other one is, let's let go of false dichotomies of whose interest is what in, in this. This is all of our interest in making these principles actually work. Um, and it's, we shouldn't think about, okay, so if we think about principle X, what is the, the uh, technical community interest in this? What is the civil society interest in this? What is the private sector's interest in this? What does government want to get out of this? Like, we need to think about this in a more holistic, multi-stakeholder way, and we actually need to involve, none of these stakeholder groups are monoliths. Business is not a monolith, government is not a monolith, so we have to make sure that we also act in our own stakeholder groups to bridge some of the differences and gaps that we might have uh, there and the, and the diversity that is there. Really excellent. Um, so for me, what I heard there is we all have to get more sophisticated in thinking about what multi-stakeholder process should look like with respect to different kinds of issues and what are best practices with those different kinds of issues. And we tend to use very generic phrases to talk about multi-stakeholder process or engagement or dialogue. But the reality is, if we're doing it well, we, each of the types of conversations needs to become more multi-stakeholder and go deeper in what that really looks like as a best practice on those issues. So, oh, somebody right here? Yeah, I think there's a mic right behind you. Hi, does this one work? Yes. Okay, well, thank you for excellent discussion, Martin Bottomon. Uh, 
one of the advantages of also thinking in the separate stakeholder groups is that you can really put in the foundations of what would bind us to that. And from that, then have on a general level the discussion of, so what binds us all, uh, should be bound on those foundations that are understood by civil society, by business, by technical community. And yes, I like academia as well, because they come from a different perspective, and governments, of course. But if you understand that, that's a good fundament to build upon, otherwise you lose the rest. Great point. I think we have one more comment in the back. You want to come on up to the mic? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Bibek Silwal from Youth IGF Nepal and also rapporteur of the government session. So in all these discussions, one thing was missing was the focus on youths. So I think youths are the catalyst which can have a multiplier effect on actually implementing the DFI visions and principles. So either as a different stakeholder or within the stakeholders, I think youths are needed to give in the seats and emphasize during these discussions. And another point is regarding the strategic foresight. So for the DFI implementation principles, we are discussing issues that are right now in terms of connectivity, but what about the issues that are coming in? So there should be a kind of emphasis that what problems might come in future and how we get prepared for it. So that's my comment, thank you. Thank you very much, Good, great point. I think now I'm going to ask Jaisha to come on up, and she's got an idea about how to best close this program <laughs> with a guest speaker. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very engaging discussion. So we have a very special guest today here. I'm very pleased to turn the floor to Ambassador Nademo, who's the Kenyan ambassador to the Kingdom of Belgium. And a fun fact is he was the organizer of the 2011 IGF in Nairobi, which was the first ever IGF to have a day zero. And so here we are on day zero, thanks to this ambassador. So please, over to you. And you can come to the podium if you'd like. First, I want to apologize that uh, I took in instructions co correctly on how to come to Kyoto International Conference Center. So the whole night I practiced and then I went to the train station and the gentleman told me, you take this way and when, then go to number two and take it. Uh, he should have said that once you get there to number, you climb up and take number two. So I went to the wrong side of the city. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, I am delighted to join you this morning, and uh, I want to give a personal testimony. First, I wasn't the only one who was in day zero. Ambassador Gross, I think, is seated there. We, we started this in Nairobi uh, when IGF was being held in Nairobi. I want to summarize these five principles uh, through my own experience. Uh, I was then in policy making and the policy at the time we were focusing on various issues and uh, we, I say we those who are in policy looked at the civil society as noise makers. Uh, one of them was Grace here who gave me hell uh, but we are very good friends now uh, that because of policy involvement with uh, civil society, we restored trust in building the digital systems in Kenya. It would not have happened that way. Uh, I say this because we have very many countries, uh, especially in the global south, who decide to shut down internet when things are wrong or when something has happened, they close it. And internet has become the most important thing. And I think everybody of you learned from uh, COVID-19. Um, we went back to teach. Uh, 
uh, while COVID was going on, were very poor people who would do business on the streets, got to do their business through WhatsApp, which was uh, uh, made to, to be one of the platforms that helped them to sell something. Uh, so it has become the most consequential thing, especially now. And uh, besides being in policy and uh, government as an ambassador, I'm also involved in uh, academia, mostly uh, looking at the future of learning. And just two months ago, we had a conference in Switzerland. Um, any government that does not invest in access uh, to internet, to broadband, um, we lose out. And as we talk about capacity building, uh, which doesn't necessarily have to include uh, academia, but also um, having uh, awareness to virtually every citizen, it is very critical. And uh, if you hear from the five groups that made, there are overlaps like Aileen was talking about. But the big question is what Patrick was asking, how do we make this um, acceptable globally? Because some countries still are uh, not um, living up to um, these uh, principles. Some close down internet, as I said. Uh, some don't trust the civil society. And yet we must work through multi-stakeholder efforts to improve access, to make sure that uh, we protect the human rights of everybody. We ac accept that different people have different views um, on, the, on the networks, uh, to have the free flow of information. Uh, and that's where the problem uh, begins. So by simply having uh, sessions like this one and then moving on to um, our own countries, um, if I may say here honestly, and I think Grace can agree, sometimes the Global South uh, thinks that some of these propositions are uh, geopolitical. Uh, I would attest here that this is not geopolitics, this is simply making sure that we ensure inclusivity across board. Um, this is the problem we have that, uh, well, this is um, um, a Western thing or this, is, this concept is this way. Uh, but if you look at these principles, they are very simple. Uh, everybody needs the right to do what they want to do then we need to make sure that we restore trust across board, just like we did with the civil society and other groups in Kenya, and uh, include everybody. Um, the gentleman there said uh, the youth who are the most users of these um, online things, the technical uh, where we need to talk about interoperability of many of the systems that are being created so this is a very key meeting. These are key um, the declaration of, that we are looking at. Hopefully we can get more countries to sign on to it. Uh, that way we can begin local discussions on how to ensure that this happens. I was the first chairman of the, um, the Inter A for AI. Uh, and we try to work on connectivity acro across the world. And still, um, you could f see the problems, especially with members of parliament. The private sector has no problem uh, getting through the government and changing things, but ordinary people have the problem, and that is where civil society comes in. If we can use the word collaboration, all of us, from technical, to private sector, civil society, we can achieve the goals that we, uh, we are discussing here today. I don't want to emphasize this more. Uh, this is what we need to do. 
Um, if some of us from the global south can know that this is the most consequential period of time that we need uh, to have these things in place. Education is going to change. And if we don't have the infrastructure because of petty politics, we will lose out. So it is mostly to those who have not uh, signed on to this and uh, leaving it, as we said, some sign up and then they go making laws uh, differently. I used to have that problem where you develop the legislation because members of parliament sometimes don't understand what you are writing about and they go down, break it down. What I used to do is that I would go sit in parliament and create friendship with some of them, explain to them differently uh, using practical examples. So lobbying is important uh, for those of you who are stakeholders that you have given these proposals to government that government is going to do it. It never happens. You would be involved through and through to the end until the legislation is made. Uh, there is not one single person who doesn't understand today that uh, some of these technologies have led to new innovations that are uh, critical to our lives. We cannot put legislations ahead of innovation. And, and I keep on insisting on this. If we can look into this, we can see much more happen. Thank you for allowing me, and I hope you forgive me for coming late. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Nademo. So on behalf of the co-organizers, Japan, the European Commission, Kenya, and the United States, I would really like to thank you all for participating today. DFI remains a high priority for the signatories, but we also recognize it is critical that we must hear from the multi-stakeholder community. And so we, we're very grateful for your active engagement in today's event. Please stay tuned on the next steps for the DFI, but we will, are very committed to working with you all um, to digest today's discussions and ideas and to moving forward with all of you in collaboration. So thank you again, and please, we would like to invite everyone to the stage for a group photo to document our success today. So please come on up. We'll have one group in the front row and, one, and various groups on the stage itself. Thank you.